Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So guys, it's time to start. Um, to be quick, let us begin. And on behalf of the Russian National Committee on BRICS Research, uh, Russia BRICS Expert Council and uh, Russian team of the BRICS International School, allow me to welcome all the participants of today's international youth webinar that is titled The Scenario of COVID-19 Across the Globe, BRICS and Beyond. Before we start our discussion, allow me to, pre uh, to present Dr. Victoria Panova, who is um, Mm, scientific Supervisor of uh, Russia BRICS Expert Council, Managing Director of National Committee on BRICS Research, and also Vice President of International Relations of the Far Eastern Federal University. Please. Uh, thank you, Valeria. Uh, dear all, it is really nice to welcome you uh, for this webinar. When I learned that there is a very uh, big desire on the part of our young researchers, students to organize such a uh, meeting. I was very pleased because I believe, uh, not, just, not just because I work uh, most of my time in the university and I am always very pleased to see new faces and to discover bright minds, uh, working in the university where the young people proved uh, over time that I've been here that uh, you, you are the ones uh, who always come out with um, really bright ideas. Uh, when you uh, are interested, enthusiastic uh, in some issue, uh, this is, uh, I'm quite sure then uh, we will be able to, as we say in Russian, which means to uh, blow up the mountains in case it's on our way. So, um, I'm really much uh, looking forward into hearing all your views. We all know that uh, from January 1st, 2020, uh, uh, the Russian chairmanship started in the BRICS. Uh, and uh, while we're living through a very interesting and difficult uh, year, uh, we will remember it not, I hope, not just for the difficulties that uh, we all encountered throughout the world, but also for their uh, new ideas, for the new initiatives that were brought about, not just by the grown up part of their uh, BRICS community, but uh, specifically by the young people, young researchers like you all are here. Uh, we are uh, very much looking forward to hearing your views uh, on how the world will look after COVID-19, but not just because uh, on that. Uh, we are uh, living in the world and it's started changing drastically, not just because of pandemics. We are living in the world of the fourth industrial revolution. We are living in the world where technologies are becoming smarter and more sophisticated, but at the same time when the humans are becoming in the center of our um, world more than ever before. It's a human-centric, knowledge-based society, new uh, stage of uh, globalization and uh, we are to, and, and we see how their uh, world is still not ready for that. And BRICS countries, as the emerging economies, as the newer leaders uh, globally, uh, have the special responsibility to bring about positive change, not revolution but uh, evolutionary uh, changes into our lives to ensure we have uh, sustainable development, to, have, to ensure that each and every person in the world uh, is able to receive benefits uh, from their mutual cooperation, from their global development, and um, also to show to the rest that um, mutual respect, mutual friendship, multi-civilizational and multicultural cooperation and um, uh, diversity, we all, are, we all are very different, that all those are prerequisites for success, for our, um, um, for the breakthroughs and for uh, really 
positive outcomes that we are expecting, not just by the end of their Russia's chairmanship, but uh, evolutionarily or, or the way ahead of us. So we are hoping to bring in new steps with uh, this year in politics, in economics, uh, as you have all heard as Bruxologists, who you, I'm sure all of you are, uh, we are looking into uh, adopting a new, a renewed um, economic partnership strategy for BRICS in, uh, till 2025. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, with three parts, digital economy, a trade investment, and sustainable development being its uh, major pillars, I'm quite sure you would be able to suggest some um, interesting ideas to, um, for, for the countries to bring forward their cooperation, to enhance it and to ensure uh, even faster and better development and uh, better security for our people, but also beyond. Uh, we are living in the world that is uh, prone to not just to uh, health problems. We are living uh, in a world where lots of challenges are rising and not a single nation state can fight against it. Also, uh, uh, countering each other would not help. So the only way we can overcome global challenges is by working together. And uh, that is why BRICS should and they have specific responsibility for that, should offer new ways to overcome, not only to overcome current crisis, but also to make sure there are special mechanisms that are able to prevent uh, possible future uh, drastic scenarios, be it in health, be it in climate change and environmental uh, problems, be it in any other socially uh, important area. And of course, uh, this webinar is a sign that we are uh, we, we were already successful in terms of bringing people together, uh, enhancing humanitarian context. Many of you know each other for quite some time. There are some new acquaintances. I'm hoping that we will be able to um, organized for more face-to-face -face meetings once the situation becomes better and uh, this will establish long-term partnerships, long-term friendships and ensure there are uh, very, um, there is, um, there are positive changes not just in the BRICS policies but there is always a um, way for them to find new um, approaches to their ever, ever arising new challenges and ever arising new uh, difficulties uh, all over the world. And you guys are the ones who will be taking the decisions uh, and you are the, guy, you are the ones who will be suggesting the solutions. Uh, so uh, very, um, I know that uh, it's being recorded and I, uh, I will try to listen to uh, as much of the seminar as possible. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, certainly listen to uh, tweet later on in record. And I hope for a very fruitful discussion between you guys and for some uh, outcomes. And also, I suggest that you do not limit yourself to this discussion, but also participate actively in the upcoming BRICS civil process that we've launched and uh, in all other activities where your energy and your um, ideas would be of high value. Thank you again and have a great discussion ahead of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're so honored to have an opportunity to listen to Dr. Victoria Panova today and uh, let us begin the discussion. So uh, we will start from Brazil, but before, please uh, allow me to uh, present Ms. Ksenia Shevtsova, who is co-moderator today. She's Chief Specialist uh, at the BRICS Russia Expert Council. And uh, I'm also happy to um, 
inform you that today we have the speakers from all of BRICS countries and even some uh, BRICS plus countries. Uh, if you have questions, you can write it in a chart or use an uh, electronic hand and ask it um, after each presentation. Uh, so please, um, I'm honored to present the first speakers from Brazil. Um, Mr. Victor need to switch on his mic before. before. Uh, All right. Yeah. This this is these are uh, my two old friends from Briggs International School, Miss Melena Magre and Mr. Vitor Mura. Uh, they will tell us about social, economic, political impacts of COVID-19 pandemic for Brazil, who is now facing the uh, highest uh, um, data on COVID uh, cases. Uh, please, Vitor, your seven minutes. Sure. Uh, I think Milena is going to share the presentation yes, with us. I am. New moment. Can you see it? Yep. A moment. So, hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is Milena, and me and my colleague Vitor, we're going to present to you the scenario of COVID-19 in Brazil. And to begin with, um, wait, hold on. We're going to introduce the three following questions or topics that will be followed up by our friend um, Beatriz. Uh, we're going to present the social, economic, and political impact of COVID-19 pandemic, the role of BRICS in changing reality, and what can the youth do to help? Victor, please, the floor is yours. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you for listening to us. My name is Victor Moura, as they said. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm going to talk a little bit about the social, economic, and political impacts that COVID had in our country. As we all know, uh, we've not been doing very well. Overall, uh, it's been quite poorly. The WHO has declared that Brazil is now the epicenter of the pandemic. We have the most daily new confirmed cases and deaths related to COVID-19. And Ian Brenner, the CEO of Eurasia Group, the political risk consultancy, has stated that, and I quote, President Bolsonaro is far and away the most incompetent leader of a democracy in his coronavirus response. So how did he manage to get such a glorious achievement? Well, as of now, we have 860,000 confirmed cases and a little bit over 43,000 deaths. That is a 5% death rate, which is much higher when compared to other countries. And that's because we've been not testing enough people. There's been no massive testing. Uh, we're only testing the people that are already seeking medical care in the hospitals. And some experts say that the real number of confirmed cases could be 10 or 20 times as much. Um, the vulnerable communities are now the most at risk. Um, uh, places that doesn't have basic sanitation, running water, or where social isolating is just not possible, uh, like favelas and indigenous communities, they are having a much harsher time. Uh, the death rate in these communities are much much higher when compared to other places. Uh, healthcare system collapse is still probable. Um, in some places, not, not as much, but in some states we have like a 90% ICU beds occupation rate, and it's hard to say what's gonna happen. And there's just been a lack of effective response from the federal government. And so far the isolation measures just have not been enough to contain the spread of the disease and flatten the curve, as the experts say. And just last week, we started, up, we started opening up businesses again. So uh, commerce, restaurants, shopping malls is all opening up. And we do expect to see a rise in cases in the next couple of weeks. I think you can switch the slide already. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this one is as that well. this Yeah, one. about the economy. Perfect. Uh, when it comes to the economy, we've been having a lot of currency instability. Uh, the Brazilian real has decreased by almost 30% when compared to the US dollar from before the pandemic. That is a very big problem for us because all the equipment, all the medical uh, equipment, all the chemical agents, all the medicines that we use to, to fight the pandemic are all, all come from abroad. It's all imported. So with a weaker currency, it decreases the government's buying power um, in, in regard to the, to the pandemic. And like every other country in the world right now, we've been dealing with a lot of unemployment. A lot of people has been displaced by this epidemic. 
and some studies say that we will get a 18 percent uh in employment by july so just next month and there's basically no government plan to deal with this uh we had a stock market crash already uh, in early march and april um we has rebounded somewhat it has to regain like 60 or 70 percent of the of the value that it decreased but um we do expect most experts say that we have we'll see another crash uh in the next few months so it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in the long term. And about politics, I think Milena is going to talk a little bit and I'll complement it. So feel free to. Thank you, Vitor. So as for the political impacts of COVID-19 in Brazil, for sure in all countries we're having, the, we're suffering the political impact of COVID-19. But in Brazil specifically, I would say that it's a, it's a, specific case, a specific situation, because Brazil is living in parallel, like in two main situations. Uh, we're not only dealing with all the impacts of COVID-19, but we're going through a major political crisis that's been going on since 2015, but especially with uh, Bolsonaro's election, and now the COVID-19 made it even worse. So we have a lot of confusion, denial, and incompetence from the federal government regarding the COVID-19 situation. Uh, we already had two ministers of health fired and currently we have no minister of health during a pandemic. Um, those were replaced by government officials or loyalists or the military. Another point that was, um, I, I believe it was um, a week or 10 days ago or so, um, the health ministry tried to withhold data about the pandemic. That means that Brazil, Brazil, the federal government, they made this decision that they would try to hide the numbers, they would not make it available for other countries or, pe or people or citizens to see the number of deaths, cases, and confirmed cases, and cured people, and so on. Nevertheless, one of the emergency uh, measures they, they took was to give um, around $120 emergency checks to people. Following that, we know that our government is flooded with corruption scandals right now, specifically. We have a possible impeachment in process. We had several inappropriate comments from the president, as you can see here on the graph, uh, following the COVID-19 cases that we had in Brazil. They were also followed by several um, unfortunate comments by our president who displayed um, a disregard to the, to the people who are suffering, saying that this is everyone's destiny, um, saying that he cannot make any miracles and so on and calling the COVID-19 a little flu, and among others. Um, so currently we have an, um, a fight going on in our political scenario between the federal government, the states, because Brazil is divided between states, just like the United States, for example, and the Supreme Court. And we're also having an, a current exchange of political positions for approval in Congress. So um, for example, the two ministers of health who were fired they were fired in the first place because they were following the measures of lockdown and confinement in, a, in agreement with the WHO, which other countries were following as well, so to stay home and to have the preventive measures. Meanwhile, President Bolsonaro was against that. So um, there is, Bolsonaro is giving these political positions in exchange for the approvals of his, his measures, his points of views, and so on. And now we're going to move to the, to the second point. What is the role of BRICS in changing reality? Well, we have a few suggestions. Those were those are very brief, um, also because we're going to expand a little bit further. Something that we can do that it can be simple to help um, to help. Um, not only I, I believe that displays of generosity they are really important to show empathy, to perhaps to help your neighbors and so on, to offer to do groceries or to go to the pharmacy. I think this those are still really important points, and we cannot lose that. We cannot lose this human touch. But however, we can also make, for instance, among BRICS countries or BRICS plus cultural lives with music genres for a specific country. So for example, um, in Brazil, we have samba, we have so many others, we can have local artists or even citizens who can send their videos playing or singing those kind of music. And we can create a whole channel with cultural, cultural displays, cultural music, cultural lives, and so on. And the, ne the next idea, I'm going to give the floor to my friend Vito. Uh, I think between us from the BRICS Youth Forum, uh, I think it would be important for us to share good information about what's going on with our countries. I think every country has been doing a lot of misinformation and just fake news in general has become like a real issue. 
And it, it would be important for us to use already our social medias and the groups that we have in WhatsApp, for example, to share about real stories that are happening in our country so we can know what is really happening in India, China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa. I think that would be a very important tool for us to have. And also when it comes to, to the lives that Milena was talking about, I, I think it would be important for us to, to get closer, even though we're isolated and far away, I think it's a good moment for us to get closer to other people on the other side of the world. Uh, we have the technology uh, to do it right now, and I think it would be a, a good opportunity to do it. Yeah, it's not always that we have the opportunity to be sharing each other's culture. I mean, in BRICS, mostly we discuss cooperation in many senses, especially political and economic, but perhaps cultural lives could make us feel a little bit closer to each other. Um, we just wanted to quote one example that what can the youth do to help uh, that happen in Brazil. We had many young people such as Buba Aguiar Initiative um, that was posted by The Guardian if you want to check up later. Since that it's called Bolsonaro won't help with the coronavirus so Brazil's favelas are helping themselves. So many people were simply going after people, asking if they need something, if they need help, if they need some, um, some supplies or any help in any sense. And they were just mapping up, collecting data and doing it themselves. So I encourage all of you who know any community, any, anyone who's in need, it can be a neighbor, it can be a whole community. You don't have to do this for the whole country, of course, but we do encourage everyone to make small actions and best practices. Well, as for our final point, this is our main idea on the role of BRICS in changing reality and what can the youth do to help. We have several proposals here that we can make in three different ways or even more. We suggest that we make some sort of report or outlook. It can be the scenario, they can be the result of this, this conference that we're having today, this webinar. We can make a report with all the arguments, all the points given today, all the valuable information that I'm sure all the experts collected to present to us today. We can put in one report and we can publish it. We can also have something such as BRICS Youth Outlook 2020, where we share um, data and information about our countries and how COVID-19 or perhaps other things such as the political and economic spheres, how they are right now in BRICS countries. So we can keep each other informed about all the other countries. We can have um, trustworthy information to, to find. It can be either an outlook or a publication, or we can even have um, a series of publications from different um, teams. We can just choose different topics and we can have a series of good publications from our experts. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And that's it. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Vittor and Milena. And now I'm uh, asking to continue Ms. Beatriz Pontes, who's going to tell us about social inequality within the Brazilian school and pandemic context. Patrice. Hello, everyone. Um, well, at first, I would like to thank for the opportunity. Um, it's a pleasure to see you again, and I hope um, everyone is well. <laughs> so um, the contribution that I have to make today um, corroborates the set and general panorama um, exposed by my colleagues. Um, I will explain a little about how Brazilian social um, inequality has impacted the school evolution of our students and how COVID-19 um, further exposed our structural problem. Um, we consider him Brazil um, this, this um, social problem as a, a structural problem. So, Against the rest of the world, Brazil, through the Ministry of Education, opted to maintain um, the National High School Exam, a test held annually for students entering high, um, higher education, a process, a process similar to the, the several countries around the world. Relativizing the global pandemic scenario, the federal government claims that the postponement or cancellation of this test would have profound impacts on the lives of students who wish to enter university. Registration for the exam began on May 11, amid the discussions about whether the exam should be postponed um, at the time when virtually all schools in the country are closed and students having to study remotely because of the new coronavirus pandemic. The the proposed remote study raised the issue of social inequality in 
uh, in an intra and extra school environment in public and private schools. Brazil has continental dimensions and even in times of global pandemic, it is no longer able to offer quality public education to elementary and high school students. In a school environment, students in public schools suffer from precarious structures, overcrowding of classes and overload of teachers. In addition, many students do not have easy access to school. When we think of remote study, the situation gets even worse. Um, recent surveys have shown that um, 49.7 million Brazilians do not have access to the internet. The reason given were the value of the service and the non viability in certain locations. The advertisement launched by the federal government encouraged students to study from anywhere, by cell phone, by internet, but I ask how? The point is that if the national exam is carried out in the middle of a pandemic or even in the post-pandemic, where the students delay in relation to the school content will be accomplished. The economic condition of the students will have a great influence on the results of the tests. Students with a privileged economic situation will have a greater chance of entering public higher education, while less privileged students will suffer from the lack of teaching, increasing the, the existing social inequality in the school environment. Um, we know that the problem of social inequality presents itself in other BRICS countries and also affects the education of those countries. Um, may we overcome these problems together by sharing the, the public policies that we practice in our countries to learn from our good examples. And saying this, I would like to say that BRICS countries have a lot to offer with this public public policies to, um, to overcome um, the situation of social inequality. So I think that's it. Thank you. So our Brazilian colleagues showed us uh, brilliant uh, presentations and uh, they used all their time. Thank you very much. I hope other speakers will also be punctual and use their seven minutes for presentations. We also have some commentators from BRICS countries who will give their two minutes comments uh, from each presentation by um, a country. And uh, the first... Um, Presenter, uh, the first commenter from uh, Brazil is uh, Mr. Vitor Langruber. Uh, I invite you to make a comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to participate in this conference. Uh, then, I would like to, to thank you for my Brazilian compatriot for the lightning presentation, I think it was really clarifying for those researchers who are outside Brazil and maybe does not have the, this broad vision about our country. I would la like to make two quick comments. The first is that uh, I think it's noticeable an increase of electronic surveillance among governments around the world. So we have China, South Africa, India, for example, using official apps to track the movement of people. And I think this is an opportunity for BRICS countries to increase the cooperation in data protection and cybersecurity that especially taking in consideration that it is a phenomenon that is already noticeable uh, since the official declarations since 2012. And the second one, I think that's a good opportunity to increase health cooperation, especially taking in consideration Brazil's know-how uh, experience and regional sort of regional responsibility in dealing with uh, regional crisis and Brazil also has kind of experience in leading uh, humanitarian missions in Africa so I think this is also an opportunity for BRICS country to increase cooperation in the field of health so just for conclusion purposes I think this pandemic is opening a great window of opportunity for BRICS and such as the 2008 financial crisis boosted the BRICS dialogue, I think this crisis also may boost uh, an intense, more intense dialogue among the BRICS group. And the second comment, 
concern the, the presentation of my Brazilian compatriots. Uh, I think that uh, Brazil is not taking proper measures in, the, in, in dealing with coronavirus, as the Milena and Vitor mentioned it. And I think this is opening a sort of vacuum of power or vacuum of regional responsibility in South America because other South American countries as, as uh, Argentina and Bolivia are doing better in dealing with this pandemic. And this in the long term may open uh, a window of opportunity for these countries to rise as regional leaders and regional seen as regional, regional leaders. So, besides that, the, 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 the way uh, Brazil is dealing with the pandemic is, all, is also uh, having concrete impacts in Brazilian society as the number of cases and deaths, unfortunately. So, these are the comments I had to make by now. Uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentations. And that's all from my side right now. Thank you. Thank you, Vitor. Actually, Vitor is also a part of BRICS International Internship Program, which is held by the Far Eastern Federal University. This is the first truly international um, internship program for BRICS students from all over the world. Um, and uh, I, would like to, uh, I would like to ask Vitor just uh, uh, to share your experience uh, within this program for a couple of seconds. Of course, uh, the program is a program of uh, cultural and academic exchange. Uh, it's official program of BRICS country and it's been held in the Far East of Federal University. Uh, right now, I'm engaged in two research projects. One of them uh, is being coordinated by Victoria Panova, as she was just here. And the experience has been quite interesting. Uh, I have uh, physical classes in the first two months. I arrived in Vladivostok on February, so I had classes until April. And then due to the pandemics, the classes started to be held, held on an uh, online platform. And as, until now, I arrived back to Brazil. I arrived here on last week. And until now, I'm having these classes. I have the opportunity to keep having these classes in the in online mechanism platform. So. It's been quite interesting. It's a very uh, interesting opportunity, and I'm really glad this I had the opportunity to participate in it. Thank you very much for sharing us uh, with this experience. Uh, there is uh, more than 150 students from BRICS countries who participated in this uh, and continue to participate in this internship program. And I guess we have uh, one more request for a comment from Brazilian side. I'm trying to find Mr. Cristiano. Yes. Um. Greetings. Greetings. My name is Cristiano, a student of international relations. I'm also fluent in, I'm also a blogger, author of a channel called Rosificando, dedicated to uh, clarify, to bring many actual informations concerning Brazil and Russia. In Russia I took part in some interview programs to talk a little about Brazil, like Razveda uh, Pras from the blogger Dmitry Kuchkov, uh, Goblin, and also with Nikolai Starikov about the political situation of Brazil. Uh, I'm from Fortaleza, a city that hosted, that had the honor of hosting the meeting of BRICS in 14. And I would like to talk a little about the political system of Brazil in order to, uh, the way that we fought, uh, that we fought the coronavirus. Brazil had a very particular situation because, as you are probably acquainted, it was one of the so-called uh, COVID-19 negationists. Like, uh, our president did not recognize the virus as a menace and, um, for such reason, he initially was against the social isolation, the quarantine measures. However, for my surprise, something that never happened before in Brazil ha happened. Uh, the governors of the state, they took the initiative of instituting such measures, such measures that even uh, closed, for example, public transportation, it was canceled. Um, it's very important 
also to give an emphasis to the role of our judiciary system that took many measures against the, um, against, um, the decisions of the president. Something I would say uh, quite uncommon for a country with a presidential system. Brazil, like the United States of America, is a presidential system. However, we had uh, measures from the judiciary system that uh, prevented the president from taking down the isolation measures. It was something very uncommon, I would say. Uh, maybe the first time it happened in Brazilian history. Also, um, still concerning the, our political system, the measures that Brazil took during this pandemic were quite uh, exotic because while many countries, they tried to find a com common dialogue, Brazil was involved into certain political intrigues with China and even Russia. For example, uh, some tweeters of the president as well as uh, people close to him, like his children, like his son, uh, blamed China for the virus. During, nine May, during May 9th, it was the same problem. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, blamed the uh, Soviet Union precisely for initiating the war together with the Nazi Germany. That during a pandemic, during a crisis, and concerning a country that is, that is close to Brazil, uh, now at BRICS. So it was a measure that um, brought a bad image of Brazil to our economic partners, such as China and Russia. And now uh, Brazil even got a bad reputation even at Russian media because of the speeches and measures of our president. So my position is that Brazil uh, behaved in an irresponsible way during this pandemic. It has a lot to evolve in order to strength to make our economic partners closer and not more distant as it's happening now. Uh, I would like to come Thank for all the marvelous explanations of our Brazilian, of my Brazilian colleagues and colleagues, and also for the time. Thank you, thank you, Cristiano. I'm also remind you that today we are trying to answer for three questions, as already our Brazilian friends uh, did. Uh, what are the social, economic, and political impacts of COVID-19 pandemic in our countries? What is the role for BRICS in the changing reality? And what can the youth do to help? And I hope all the speakers and all the participants and also commentators will try to give their new ideas and initiatives on how to um, adequately answer these uh, three questions. And uh, uh, now we have a short Q&A session after Brazilian part. So maybe somebody of you uh, have questions or more comments? Please raise your hand or write it in the chat. So Larry, I believe there's a question to us. Yeah, I see from uh, Evgeny Kornev. Um, I'll read it for you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, guys, uh, what do you think about the possibility of rise of socialist forces influence in Brazil in the context of political and socio-economic situation in the stage, uh, state during the pandemics? It's a question from Evgeny Kornev, Saratov State University. So maybe, Milena, you will answer or your colleagues. Sure. Um, I can do the first part if my colleagues want to continue. Um, I, enjoy, I invite them to do so. Um, I believe that it's unlikely that we'll have any... Um, rise of socialist forces influence in Brazil because Brazil has had, um, let's say, a left-wing party on the power for almost 15 to up to 20 years. And um, in the past years, especially during the elections, we had, the country was split in two, those who are more left-wing, pro-left-wing and pro-right-wing. And this way we had a very strong opposition um, due to many reasons that they were blaming those left-wing, those socialist, um, socialist parties, we can say, they're not exactly socialist, they're just left-wing, but anything that is associated with socialism, communism, or left-wing, um, th those icons, they became very, they became the source of hate. They became the, 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 the source of many opposition 
rights in Brazil. And this is why, for instance, we had um, a president who is far right wing who won the election, which is Bolsonaro. So I believe that there will, there will be no rise, at least for now, during this um, during President Bolsonaro, because even if he is impeached, his uh, vice president is still a right wing. And uh, I do not believe that for the next years of his mandate, we will have any rise of social measures. OK, thanks. Vitor, would you like to comment? Uh, sure. Uh, I think that, as, as Milena said, uh, we still have two and a half years of President Bolsonaro's mandate. And so far, impeachment doesn't seem likely uh, because there is not enough approval in Congress. He still holds more than 200 or uh, 200 and something uh, congressmen on, on his side. So impeachment is not a possibility at the moment. And so far, our institutions, uh, the checks and balances of uh, the Supreme Court and, uh, and the executive and the legislative power have been able to keep uh, uh, Bolsonaro's more authoritative, authoritative tendencies at bay. Uh, but it's hard to say because it's been a clash of the three main powers in government here. And it's hard to, hard to know what's going to happen in like a year or two. So uh, it's unpredictable, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Beatrice, would you like to comment? Yeah, I would say that besides sorry, the... Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's my, is my turn? Ladies first, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I am affiliated um, at the Brazilian Socialist Party. And from within the party, I can say that these um, left forces here in Brazil uh, do not unify their positions and consequently cannot add against the Bolsonaro extremist, uh, uh, extremist forces. So uh, it's very difficult to fight against him. And as Victor said, um, impeachment, it's, it's not um, possible at the moment. So we're living in a situation, a very difficult situation right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vitor or Cristiano? I, can I go? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure, sorry. Just, <laughs> just emphasizing what Beatrice just said, I think that besides that what Milena and Vitor commented, uh, the Brazilian left is not united. Uh, so the parties have relatively different positions and, and divergences among them. And the left did not unite during the presidential election to fight Bolsonaro, and it seems that they will not be united right now. So I think the future is very unpredictable, and I wouldn't believe that uh, it, was, it, it would have happen uh, an increase in the socialist forces in Brazil. Okay, thank you. And maybe Cristiano, the last, if you would like. No. Okay. Um, if there is no any questions uh, for Brazilian guys, uh, oh no, we have one. Um, in your opinion, uh, how did the Bolsonaro's policy and behavior during the pandemic affect the image of the country and the identity of Brazilians? And what could be the consequences? Uh, this is a question from our correspondent from TV Bricks. So uh, could you please, guys, answer the question shortly? Please, Can you're I? welcome. Yeah, um, yeah, Vitor. Well, uh, so far, I mean, it depends to which country you're talking about. Uh, I mean, Bolsonaro has been decreed, like, has been damaging Brazilian image abroad since he got into office. Uh, when it comes to the environment, for, for example, he's been doing um, cutting regulations, allowing for uh, more deforestation, and that has really impacted our image with European Union. It is probably like uh, you had a... a, 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 a we're gonna have uh, an agreement with European Union. It's probably not gonna happen anymore because of it. But other countries like China, I feel that they only see uh, Bolsonaro as a step on the road. They, they don't add, like after Bolsonaro is gone, Brazil is gonna still uh, be an important partner uh, when it comes to food security. 
So other countries like China have been able to just avoid his image and not deal with it as much. But other countries like the European Union, it has really damaged our relations. So it has been like a direct economic impact because of his actions. Okay, thank you. Milena Vitor and Beatrice. Um, I would like to say that we have moved from a position of a country capable of influencing the global agenda um, together with the BRICS, EBUS, and so on, um, to the position of a spectator um, and denialist country for international cooperation initiatives. So this is terrible. <laughs> okay, maybe someone else is going to comment. Uh, I yeah, Vitor, you, you first. Thank you. I personally think that in the long term, Brazil will no longer be seen as the South America representative. As is mentioned in my comments, uh, Brazil is not taking the proper measure and other countries in the region are taking, such as Bolivia and Argentina especially. Uh, so I, th I think this damaged the, the image that we have been constructing since our independence as the regional leader, as the regional uh, example. And in the long term, I think this will really be damaged. And to reconstruct this, it will take really uh, a lot of work. Thank you. If we consider what has been published, for example, in Russian media, for example, Riafan and also on other, on other papers, uh, there is not any doubt that his actions damaged the image of Brazil, especially during the last manifestations, during the last meetings that happened in Sao Paulo, for example, when some supporters of Bolsonaro appeared carrying a flag of Bravo Sector from Ukraine, that certainly damaged even more the image of Brazil, of, Brazil, of Brazilians. Uh, when now some of his supporters talk about the Ukrainization of Brazil, about uh, an Ukrainian receipt. That's something that certainly brings us problems at the international plan. Thank you, Cristiano. And before we switch to Russia block, I can remind you to, um, to save the link to the Civil Bricks uh, Forum uh, website. Uh, if somebody of you have uh, any ideas uh, or any comments, uh, after our discussion, uh, you can work on it and uh, you can uh, send it to us using the application form so we can develop uh, the um, cooperation among civil BRICS um, um, platform and between civil, uh, civil society of uh, five countries and even more in the BRICS plus format. And now I'm... Uh, Honored to invite the speakers from Russia. So the first uh, presentation on the contradictions of the globalization and deglobalization process uh, aimed at the COVID-19 pandemic, the world in BRICS. Uh, we have two uh, presenters, Mr. Igor Szymanowski and Ms. Valera Pronina, who are also the uh, participants of BRICS International School. Uh, these are seven minutes for you guys, please. Hello, dear colleagues. Hello, friends. Please, you can start. Thank you, Valeria. Uh, me and uh, my colleague, Valeria Purina, is going to present you some points and some uh, thoughts on the topic. Now we're going to present uh, and uh, some, some conclusions as well. So we decided to analyze the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the international relations through the prism of the global level, the BRICS format level, and the bilateral cooperation of Russia and BRICS countries. So we have three levels of analysis. So at the global level, we observed the continuation and a certain extent and the development of two opposite trends. The first one is globalization and the second one is the globalization. Concerning the globalization trends, we want to underline the United Nations efforts to strengthening the global community to fighting against COVID and uh, some humanitarian calls. 
Uh, among them, for instance, such ideas and appeals as, for instance, uh, to create a global coalition to develop COVID-19 vaccine. And the second one is to cease fire and to stop all the wars around the Earth. The third one, for example, is to abolish all the sanctions around the world. There were also other initiatives, for instance, uh, G20 online summit with declarations take jointly in the struggle against COVID. It's notable that there wasn't special brief conference uh, as usually occurs during the offline summits and uh, uh, it's, it is rather pity. As well, uh, in June, there was held the Global Vaccine Summit 2020 for mobilizing resources needed by the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Of course, it was other alliance, online summits and events. So in general, we can see that uh, international cooperation was continued by the politicians uh, during the pandemic. Of course, we have to note that uh, communication intensity has decreased and the real fulfillment of adopted decisions and declarations is under the question. Valeria? Uh, thank you. Um, COVID-19 has accelerated all processes and uh, uh, deglobalization is not an exception. Uh, today we see um, some key points. The first one is closed borders. Now uh, even some European member states are still imposing stringent border control measures, which of course violate the uh, trade, uh, free trade uh, rules. Uh, recreational industries are in profound downturn. And there is a forecast that they will be unable to resume their work uh, during the upcoming one, one and a half years. Uh, Closed borders also hamper trade migration. It, was, it refers both to inner and outer globalization. The second key point is protectionism measures. Now all countries are trying to prevent uh, takeovers of national companies. It's easy to do during the train hour of throwaway prices. For example, India has adopted Foreign Direct Investment Act, uh, Act of, which means that all FDE which come to India should be checked and approved by Indian government. Now all countries are turning to proprietorial approach to technical sectors because these sectors are bound to prosper in post-COVID world. Um, for example, United States um, imposed new set of sanctions on Huawei products. And of course, we should mention Defense Production Act, which was invoked by Donald Trump, and which means that uh, all American companies are bound to prioritize governmental contracts and uh, not to merge with the foreign companies. Uh, the third point is isolation policy. It predominantly um, refers to Donald Trump policy and here is his quotations that uh, depicts his position. Last but not least uh, is the crisis of the World Health Organization because of charges uh, to this organization from the American and Brazilian president. So if we can see even at uh, our national levels in Russia, in Brazil, in India, in China, and uh, even in South Africa, we can see that even um, the borders between the states of the country, between the parts of the country were closed. And uh, this is a kind of so deglobalization uh, characteristic also. So at the BRICS multilateral level, we also see the decrease of the communication intensity. But nevertheless, this spring, uh, they were provided meetings at the level of the senior officials of ministries of health, ministers for foreign affairs, heads of the fiscal bodies, uh, the heads of the um, Ministry of Education, etc. So there is a joint work on the platform of the new development bank. Uh, Russia's president, if you see at the bilateral relations, we can see that Russia's president Vladimir Putin had telephone calls with the heads of India, South Africa, China. Unfortunately, there is no such deep contacts with current Brazilian head as well, and uh, our colleagues from Brazil mentioned above about uh, contacts of uh, Jair Bolsonaro with the uh, European colleagues, and uh, Russian uh, colleagues is not even an exemption, and we have no close cooperation between Brazilian counterparts as uh, counterparty during the pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, of course, uh, Russian presidency in BRICS has to be correct, and maybe Revise taking taking into account absence of the planned agenda realization. 
And under these circumstances, um, a good question is what's next? Can we do any forecasts about what we will see, disintegration or integration? On the one hand, we see a vaccine competition, US-China confrontation, which was exacerbated by the COVID-19, and uh, the suspension of the meetings, for example, G7, G20, and BRICS, I mean, offline meetings. Uh, but we should take into account that uh, these are temporary measures and all these organization clubs uh, are looking forward to resume their work in full swing. For example, uh, BRICS countries are now thinking over implementation of Russian sharing principles on the upcoming years. Uh, and uh, we should not forget that uh, globalization is not only a tangible thing. Now we can face globalization through digitalization. For example, Chinese uh, technical companies are now in great demand, especially in the One Belt, One Road region. So um, the forecast all depends on two factors. The first factor is the second wave of the virus, and the second uh, factor is the uh, invitation of the vaccine. Uh, will a person or an organization who invent the vaccine be able to share it with the other world or not? This is the question that will predetermine our future development. Thank you. Of course, if I, if I add the Valeria, of course, we, we support that the vaccine will be shared around the world, but uh, the mechanism of the sharing and the uh, uh, cooperation of the states uh, could be uh, different from the regional, from the block to block. And uh, of course, one more interesting um, initiative uh, during the pandemic is to uh, invitation of Donald Trump uh, to create G11 uh, forum uh, with the uh, invitation, invitation of India and uh, Russia from BRICS and uh, without invitation of China and Brazil and uh, South Africa. That's an, an interesting uh, case, but I, th I think that uh, BRICS uh, hasn't to see, hasn't to see uh, this uh, event uh, too seriously, and uh, we should to continue. We should continue our uh, agenda by ourselves and uh, together in the FIFS members of BRICS. Thank you very much for your attention, and we are ready to respond to your questions. And uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Um, maybe some questions for the first presentation, or we'll next move to the next present presenter. Okay, let's move on. Um, I'm happy to present uh, Ms. Anastasia Pietachkova, who is also a specialist on uh, Russia-China relations. He is a researcher, she is a researcher at uh, uh, High School of Economics University and um, she will give us an outlook on China's response to coronavirus and its implications for BRICS. Uh, Anastasia, this is your seven minutes, please. You're welcome. Sorry, I had some technical issues. Uh, um, have you seen my presentation? Yeah, for a couple of seconds, maybe you will start to talk and uh, the presentation will uh, appear. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. So uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here today. And um, I would like maybe to, uh, first of all, um, raise some issues. Uh, so um, I would like to bring more general agenda and maybe to answer uh, some questions that Dr. Panova has raised uh, in the beginning of uh, today's presentation, as my colleagues have, have already covered uh, some of them. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, tell that uh, the coronavirus uh, itself and uh, the uh, the event, uh, such event as uh, epidemia, is not uh, was not uh, so uh, un unexpected un, um, and uh, we have seen many cases beforehand and uh, I guess the, the key question is 
that we have big data, but we cannot work with it. And uh, security, uh, and uh, we should uh, maybe ask the question at which point the securitization comes. Uh, so uh, we do see many information and we do see many data and many numbers, but at which point uh, do they become a, a threat to us? Uh, and at which point uh, some uh, local disease becomes uh, a threat to the whole planet? Uh, and uh, as for China, I guess uh, I won't be uh, very precise on the concrete studies because everyone uh, comes uh, and follows them on news, but still uh, I'd like to uh, tackle some uh, general uh, directions uh, because uh, at the very beginning, I guess um, the whole planet was uh, very worried about what was going on in China and there was uh, Wuhan Jiao, so China uh, be strong, but uh, after that uh, the countries had divided and some of them became blame China uh, uh, about not being able to cope with the pandemics and uh, actually Chinese aid, which is a good thing, right, uh, and uh, uh, became mask diplomacy or full very diplomacy and China was uh, perceived as a very tough uh, country uh, on these issues. Uh, and uh, actually the US-China confrontation is becoming institutionalized during these pandemics and we see that very clearly. And the case with Hong Kong and with imposing sanctions of China and we all know that uh, the uh, sanctions are um, including into the yes law which is more serious than just uh just uh, threatening uh, by words right uh, and um uh, actually many uh, experts in the us such tell that there is an anti-china consensus within the us elite and it doesn't matter which president comes uh, this still the the trend is the following and i guess for the BRICS countries is a very serious tendency uh and um uh, some countries uh, cooperate both with China and the US, but actually all the countries but a different scale. Uh, and uh, if some uh, very urgent issues occur and uh, the countries should take sides, that is very, I guess, uh, threatening thing for the BRICS. And uh, another level is regional level and bilateral level, because uh, for instance, in April, they were um, uh, raising agenda on uh, Mekong issue. And uh, it was told that uh, China was building dams and that's why uh, less water comes to uh, lower Mekong uh, countries and uh, the, the opportunity of droughts increases. And we all know that coronavirus brought very serious concerns about, secure, uh, about food security issues. Uh, and uh, again, a uh, uh, serious confrontation, well, not maybe uh, as serious as another uh, war confrontation, but still many conflicts like are going on with China, or the, uh, between China and Australia right now. And uh, we all should think of the models of cooperation and uh, uh, not to make our world more co confrontational place uh, as uh, it is right now. So if we take China as a case study, we will we'll see that uh, uh, there are uh, different major measures that were tackled by different regions and uh, uh, for instance even in, the, in March and April there was a situation that some regions were easing uh, the, the uh, lockdown but others for instance uh, on, on the border of on the Russian border because there were imported cases uh, in, in such cities in Hanghe was doing vice versa and uh, as for economic aid um, uh, basically, uh, there are different numbers, but still, um, uh, um, I guess, um, uh, so you know, we should uh, deal with the, con the consequences first, and we see the, that the growth fell by more than 6%, uh, and uh, actually, um, after the, six, uh, the latest two sessions, uh, China is not um, doing a fixed aim on GDP growth anymore and uh, as for unemployment um, well the numbers are discussable and uh, there are some claims that Chinese statistics are not really correct it's because the the uh, the, um, uh, um, the difference was not very high but we still uh, don't know uh, what it will happen uh, because Li Keqiang was actually talking about the fact that uh, dealing with unemployment uh, will, will be one of the priorities uh, and one of the key priorities and actually the, the initiative with mass market uh, was one of the ways to somehow deal with unemployment situation and the decrease of um, salaries and uh, 
uh, that ordinary people haven't to stimulate growth, but uh, we now see that it led to a new outbreak of coronavirus and again, uh, it is a very difficult situation. So uh, most experts um, come to the conclu conclusion that uh, China Chinese economy will um, recover on EU curve, uh, uh, so uh, it, it will uh, grow grow uh, and continue to grow. The, the most uh, uh, forecast um, um, they are about two or three percent, uh, but uh, some Chinese experts are more optimistic on this point. Here is uh, some uh, targets that um, Chinese government actually has, and uh, 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 and some updates that uh, they were implemented. But the key problem, I guess, and the key implication be that China, uh, that COVID is not over. And uh, first of all, of course, important important cases and uh, the uh, outbreak that's happened on Beijing market. Uh, so uh, thousands of people are being checked right now, and we still don't know where it comes. And there was also the news that. Um, um, uh, it, it spread all over other regions, not, not only in Basin, but we'll see how it goes further. So uh, I, I think that BRICS is uh, somehow, the situation is somehow very close to uh, the Bible situation with four horsemen or for apocalypse, right? So we have plague, we have disease, we have war, and we have conflicts, uh, wars and protests ongoing. Uh, and uh, there, and our Brazilian friends have already uh, talked about um, political instability and we see political instability in other kind of even BRICS countries and uh, apart from BRICS countries uh, and there are also some embedded uh, um, threats for instance population uh, uh, growth rates because uh, in this situation in this uh, situation with uh, economic fall down um, uh, this could be really, really increasing the level of deaths because of diseases, because of uh, hungry or undernourishment. Uh, the situation will help the, with our health will becoming worse, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, of course, um, other other factors have not disappeared. For instance, Asia Pacific region, as we all know, is very. Um, uh, uh, dangerous place in terms of uh, um, 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 natural disasters and of course they will also um, influence the situation with uh, for instance um, our uh, food security as well and uh, uh, again uh, the the product chains and so on and so forth so here is the picture with growth uh, with GDP growth rate uh, um, and uh, I, I just show that in order to show in which reality rigs will be uh, uh, surviving I guess uh, in the nearest months and trying to, to develop uh, and for many BRICS countries the situation is uh, rather di would be rather difficult um, and if we're coming for Russia so the situation with oil prices for instance will definitely affect what will, will be going on um, and the, the, here is also the picture with unemployment rates so talking about uh, social economic consequences and uh, answering these three questions maybe I'll also talk about Russia a little bit. Uh, Anastasia, please switch on your mic. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. I, I don't know why this happened, sorry. Uh, so, um, just uh, if we talk for some um, implications for BRICS, so we already, if we only take uh, China and Russia example, uh, we'll see that uh, the, uh, for instance, our bilateral trade is falling uh, for for the uh, nearest five months by nearly 8%. Uh, but there are two interesting trends uh, that uh, one of the experts mentioned. So first is that uh, the agriculture input from China is growing. Uh, and basically that is a good thing, especially the imports of meat. Uh, but the other thing is that the volume of trade uh, may be even increasing. For instance, if we take uh, oil, it increased more, more than uh, 10 million tons. But uh, the price for this uh, import, uh, so the, the actual uh, asset uh, price is declining. And uh, uh, we received, I mean, we Russia received about uh, $19 billion less uh, for, for this price than, than uh, it could be in other conditions. And uh, for Russia, that would be definitely um, influencing what will be going on and uh, what kind of consequences do we have. Again, um, 
on the Russian side, so uh, as for uh, unemployment, uh, it, it increased about, uh, well, there are different data, but uh, about 23% if comparing to March, uh, uh, and uh, well, uh, the, the, the numbers differ up to 8 million people uh, right now, um, and uh, I guess that uh, taking into account overall effects and uh, the, um, we all should work together and see uh, what opportunities do we have for, for each other uh, and um, just concluding remark about what can youth do so uh, as I'm uh, um, teaching at university I can definitely say that uh, education uh, is a new challenge for all of us on both sides uh, and I guess that is very important thing. First of all, uh, to adapt to this new reality because uh, the uh, online courses and online education we are reality at least for some time and it's uh, at our uh, benefit to do it as beneficial and efficient as possible. So your feedback as a student, your suggestions uh, or uh, just all this youth cooperation on education would be very uh, good thing and uh, another thing is uh, as I mentioned so we have a lot of data but we don't see the threats uh, and um, uh, and we also don't see new professions for instance that will be uh, at a high demand very soon so uh, I guess uh, only youth has the courage and uh, maybe uh, the creative potential to uh, identify what will be going on what will be interesting in, in the future and uh, what we all can do about it and uh, the uh, the uh, maybe the last thing I would say is um, uh, that uh, there is a very interesting thing uh, called virtual vol volunteering uh, and uh, I think that for people who are starting their careers volunteering uh, at any organizations both research organizations or uh, any social dimension and we all mentioned uh, we have tackled only two countries yet but uh, we all see that there are socio-economic uh, threats in both of them uh, and uh, the participation of youth uh, starting maybe new businesses new initiatives uh, in this sphere would be a very good thing we cannot only rely on governments that someone will come and solve our problems for us uh, I, I guess that um, engaging uh, the engagement of all institutions both from business side from universities from youth side from experts can bring us to better results thank you Thank you, Anastasia. Indeed, according to the IMF forecast, only China and India among BRICS will have will show us a positive growth in real GDP in 2020. And thank you very much. I see the requests for the presentations of speakers. Uh, these presentations are really interesting. So please, all the speakers, uh, you can uh, send the presentations for me and I will share uh, them uh, with our participants. Um, I guess... Is it a question? Okay, just a second, Christiana, I will read it. Um, before we um, ask and answer the questions, I would like to uh, uh, give a floor to Mr. Mikhail Larkov, uh, who is going to tell about us about forced digitalization and the, its impact on high and uh, supplemented education uh, in course of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Yeah, please, your seven minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, as a quick way of introduction, it was, uh, you know, this presentation is going to be a little of a, uh, to be a little bit of a flashback because of how many important points were raised by other speakers. And, you know, it's actually a great pleasure to see some people from as far as Shanghai and Moscow. So uh, I do believe we are going to have um, quite a fruitful discussion today. Uh, just a quick info on me. Um, my name is Mikhail Larkov. I'm currently studying international relations in Lomonosov Moscow State University. And uh, BRICS is uh, my field of study, though not precisely digitalization and education, uh, because um, my key interest is probably NDB at this point with uh, the international finance and whatnot. But um, as a student myself, I felt that it was the right way to talk about digitalization. Uh, you see, it's a really important topic in the Russian political discourse at this point with uh, the national projects being discussed. It is also a trend in the whole world and especially with the pandemic we did see quite a few uh, interesting effects on what uh, digital education really is. So as an executive summary uh, we do understand that the COVID-19 pandemic did have a huge effect. It did impact so many things and 
when we get to consider certain aspects of uh, national systems of education, we do have to admit that the ad tech market proved more viable. So um, in say an argument between supplementary education and higher education, uh, which in Russia is mostly um, budget funded, like state funded, we do have to admit that ad tech market looked um, say more positively than the, than the rest. Um, we also have to admit that difficult these were everywhere. So there probably is no country that uh, managed to breeze through the whole thing because there were so many problems. And we do understand that BRICS actually have the opportunity to come up with the joint response to this whole thing. And uh, it is quite obvious that youth uh, being the primary consumer of higher supplementary education as well as uh, its producer to a large extent when it comes to AdTech in particular is fundamental, is essential to solving the issue. Um, so uh, just as, a, say, a quick reminder, what could it be? Um, the Russian International Affairs Council had a, an amazing article dedicated to the scenarios of, um, uh, of uh, the pandemic affecting higher education in different countries. And we can basically come up with three main ones, which is transition failed, uh, which we could see in certain cases like uh, the University of Buenos Aires in uh, Argentina, I believe, that has completely halted all studies for the time being due to inadequate technological assets and administrative failures. We could see transition being, we, we could see certain transitions undergoing, but they were still impeded. Um, it probably is the case with uh, Chile and Great Britain, where there were a lot of student strikes uh, against uh, the policies of their universities because the students were not willing to pay the money for uh, the education that has completely transformed and was probably declined in quality when uh, being offered in a digital way. And finally, we could say that transition has relatively successfully undergone. And this is what we see in certain institutions or national systems. And uh, I'm quite happy to admit that according to uh, my personal, uh, like uh, my personal research, Russia seems to have followed the first scenario, which is a really satisfying thing to see. So um, my, uh, the, the survey I have conducted uh, recently included the question of how ready were, uh, how ready certain parties uh, were towards the pandemic. And as you can see, the ratings are pretty similar. Uh, we could see that students basically were proved to be more ready, uh, proved like more ready than the rest. Administration uh, ranking the lowest, not far from the teaching staff, however. But um, you see, the readiness aspect is quite controversial because what we get to talk about here is more about adaptiveness than readiness. So nobody really forecasted the pandemic, and it was about uh, being able to act quickly and um, fix things on the run. And Although the rating does seem a little low, it's still, uh, it's still uh, more than satisfactory, which means that uh, generally uh, all parties engaged in the educational process quite managed with the problem. Um, however, we do have to admit that um, the quality of education itself, which may seem a little counterintuitive, was not really as amazing. Because as you can see, as much as like more than 90% of people, like nine among 10, do say that the quality of education either declined or did not change. And as you can see, when it comes to uh, how uh, digital services are assessed by certain individuals, we do see that 40 rate them as below satisfactory and one third deems them satisfactory, leaving only about 27% saying that they're pretty much satisfied with what they have. Um, that being said, uh, there was also a question about which um, aspects of digital services are most important to certain people. I know this is a bit of a marketing research at this point, but uh, I guess uh, it, it's really important to understand the issue. And um, you, you can see them on screen, but feedback application, a certain instrument that might allow you to get uh, direct feedback from, say, a member of a teaching staff or administration was voted as the most needed and required. This may lead us to two assumptions. One, um, this this application is non-existent in the learning management systems currently employed by certain universities or that they are to be developed soon enough or optimized. So um, summing up for what analysts got to say and my personal research, uh, we could generally say that uh, costs pretty much increased as much as 50% in the industry, in the industry of um, say um, state higher education. Uh, due to introducing distance learning. And quite obviously, this increase implies quite a lot of things. So the policies could change, uh, wages could be decreased, uh, you know, additional budget funding might be requested. 
uh, it is not good. When costs grow, it's never good. Um, also, um, despite costs rising, you, expect, you would expect the quality to remain the same or improve, but it actually declined. It, it is what we see and it is quite unfortunate. Um, meaning that the management, the learning management systems do need to be, do need to be optimized. And finally, due to this whole thing and due to the nature of the pandemic, we have to admit that digitalization was largely forced. It was not voluntary and a whole number of undertakings that certain universities and institutions had to take um, were all about um, the, the, the need and not, they were not voluntary. They were not, um, you know, some, something that they would uh, do on their own. They needed uh, a certain, uh, certain uh, circumstances to happen for this to take place. Um, at the same time, what we do see is that uh, EdTech market and supplementary online education is really showing better results. And we are considering both MOOCs, massive open online courses, and the corporate segment in this regard. So just the numbers for April, we do see that Coursera had uh, a 67% monthly growth in sessions, edX 52% growth in sessions. And when it comes to Russian corporate segment in particular, uh, namely the Sberbank Corporate University and MTS Corporate University, uh, which is, I, I believe, called Smart University, they do say that the traffic either increased more than twice, uh, the demand for certain services has largely increased, and uh, permanent users also retain a, a larger number of activities on uh, these websites. So what this means is that um, given the portfolio they offer, they also mark that soft skills are in, in, in an amazing demand. Like it, it basically is thrice as much as it used to be. Uh, IT and professional following up, uh, but still, but still displaying some great numbers. And when we get to see these particular subjects, we do understand that uh, the higher education itself, the one that uh, had to face so many difficulties and uh, displayed a decline in the quality of education, does not uh, does not supply their students with these particular things because they get to resort to uh, a different platform. They get to resort to the private sector for this. Uh, uh, thing, uh, say services like Skillbox and whatnot, and this is a really disappointing thing because we got to see this for a number of years now, and now it's skyrocketed due to the pandemic, and we get to admit that certain aspects are not really taught in universities at this point, and there is actually a fix for this. So, academic for, uh, BRICS Academic Forum and BRICS Youth Forum, I believe, are great platforms for fostering discussion in the first place about this aspect. But more importantly, coming up with a discreet and quite obvious proposal to how to, how, how to manage with this. So a competitive digital infrastructure as, say, a project, as a development project, which could potentially be financed even by NDB for higher supplementary education seems like a viable solution. We do want to see academia and private sector exchange their best practices with the support of state representatives and state institutions, because this is what, uh, for, at least from the Russian perspective, our system of education is, uh, as I had previously said, is state funded. So this is why we cannot you know, forget about them at all. And it is all about um, making something competitive. And competitive uh, in this day and age means that we need to come up with infrastructure that is innovative, commercially viable, and scalable. And, you know, the three-step approach um, on the right quite largely explains this. Uh, my point here is that when we get to see certain platforms as, say, Coursera or edX uh, or the Skillbox, uh, they all were certain startups. They were certain projects until, um, meaning that they were independent. There was, uh, you know, a small team coming up with an idea, uh, allocating finance, and then, boom, the miracle happened and they got it. And it is quite obvious that uh, the five countries that initiated one of the uh, one of the the most famous one of the I, I personally think one of the greatest uh, financial institution initiatives, which was the NDB back in 2015, um, can definitely allocate finance for this. But like all countries, definitely have specialists that do discuss certain topics, that do communicate with each other, and that means that they can come up with uh, the proper response to this. And it is quite obvious that um, being both the largest consumer and a relative producer of these particular services, it is the youth that 
plays the fundamental role, first in discussions, then in development. But at this point, we are considering only certain verbal interactions in order to find out how to uh, come up with this. And the two pillars here are quite obviously the best practice exchange, which, is, which probably does not need any additional explanations of the feedback. Uh, I remember listing it back uh, in the survey results segment. It's all about feedback and being able to properly interact. As soon as we get um, the opportunity to commune properly, exchange ideas, then we might be able to be talking about certain startups and projects, and then we might be able to move on with them. And this actually means that, um, you know, given that uh, digital infrastructure is not even an essential, it's like the, it's the obvious part of education nowadays, and when it comes to cost-effective services in particular, especially considering the BRICS countries. Um, the strategic interests say education was always listed in all the declarations that we get to read. And given the fact that BRICS countries do tend to follow their pledges and do get happen to fulfill them, um, it is quite obviously the goal. It's possibly, it's easily achievable. And I cannot reiterate enough how, youth, how young specialists, young entrepreneurs, uh, younger academia, are uh, the primary actors when solving this issue because it is the younger ones that might come up with the more progressive ideas. They just need to properly, uh, they just properly need to summarize them and then come up with solutions to the burning problems we have nowadays. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, let's move on to our commentators. The first one is Mr. Vitaly Savinkov. He's an advisor on international relations and the Ruski Technopark, which is located uh, at the Far Eastern Federal University. So we have Vladivostok here. Uh, can you hear us? Yep. yep. Yeah, please, your comment. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Really interesting. Um, so I really like the latest comment about the forced uh, digitalization um, and uh, the forced change. Yeah, whether we like it or not, uh, the world, no matter what, government, business, society, academia, um, was meant to change. Yeah, and I guess the fastest. Uh, they got more opportunities through this COVID-19 and we see a uh, very significant um, increase in terms of uh, IT services, uh, in terms of yeah, some uh, ed tech uh, technologies, but also we can obviously see uh, significant losses uh, in terms of the slowest, those who were not managed to adapt, uh, by any means, okay? So, um, for example, um, uh, for science and technology parks, yeah, we recently had a survey uh, of Asian Science Park Association, and um, most of science and technology parks um, began to render their services online. So the rate uh, is close to 80 or 90 percent. Uh, of online servicing, yeah, so it is easy, uh, best practices exchange, mentorship, um, expertise and negotiations, of course. Even online pitching uh, is very much possible and uh, for like what, three months already uh, remains probably the only uh, option for investments, the only option to grab attention from institutional players uh, for young promising startups. And um, I guess that uh, BRICS countries uh, have enormous, enormous potential in terms of uh, technology, in terms of innovations and startups. And um, this so-called like online uh, rise um, deprives us from the main uh, the main uh, disadvantage, the main obstacle of the territory, yeah, so like for me it is already June 16th, like three minutes already of June 16th, yeah, but it's very early morning in, in Brazil now, and uh, yeah, that, that, that's hilarious and, and wonderful, uh, but on the second thought, I didn't need to buy a ticket to go to Brazil to, to participate in this event, for example, or even to Moscow, which is like still nine hours flight from Vladivostok. And I guess um, this so-called crisis, uh, of course, with um, 
tragic, tragic consequences, uh, death and uh, uh, terrible losses also brings us uh, a ladder to, to uh, positive change. And I do hope that the youth uh, uh, with their efforts combined and concentrated uh, has a very enormous, enormous potential on, on this matter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us despite the time difference. Uh, we have another commentator, but before, please, uh, um, maybe you can start to ask questions for the Russian team. I would like to ask uh, Ms. Nina Ladigina Glazunova for a comment. She is also part of BRIC Studies program at State um, St. Petersburg State University, actually my own university, and um, uh, Ms. Nina is uh, going to comment on um, her view of this uh, problem. Please, Nina. Uh, hello, Valeria. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your presentations. Everything was very interesting, especially presentations of my colleagues from Russia and Brazil. I hope it will be so on with China, uh, South Africa, and India. Uh, I would have uh, a few comments uh, or maybe proposals about what the youth can do in this situation with the coronavirus pandemic uh, and uh, uh, we have a big potential in volunteer work. Uh, we have so many volunteers all around the world that are now helping people uh, just not for a salary, not for something, just because they want to help people. Uh, like in Russia we have a project, uh, we are together, uh, that has combined more than 117,000 volunteers from all over Russia that help the elderly. They help uh, online, they, ha they help with uh, their uh, automobiles uh, to deliver food, to help to buy medicine, to have psychological work with people, to answer calls that uh, sometimes uh, needed for people on the hotline. And more than three million people already got this help. And I know that my colleagues from South Africa also have a lot of this kind of projects and uh, make a lot of work on this in this field. And uh, I think that uh, in future, or maybe in the nearest future, we could use the platform of the BRICS uh, Network University uh, also for vo volunteer work and to combine uh, on this platform of the, of the BRICS Network University a platform for volunteers from all over uh, the world, maybe not just BRICS countries, but also BRICS countries plus uh, to uh, share what they have done and how it could be better uh, implicated in their countries and to translate this work uh, to other countries. Also, maybe we can help not just by advising someone, but uh, by real help. Because um, today, uh, China and India are uh, solving the problem with coronavirus a lot better and faster than uh, Russia and other BRICS countries. And uh, we can use their advice uh, in uh, the sphere of, in, of volunteers. Uh, and also, uh, I think that uh, today uh, we need to use the BRICS platform, uh, the BRICS network platform uh, a lot more uh, intensively because today it's not working as good as uh, it should be. And also we can use it also in the problem that has occurred with us, the students. Many students this year uh, in all the BRICS countries have faced uh, problems with uh, digitalization, online uh, studying, and uh, there are problems. Some, uh, for some uh, people it's, uh, a lot easier for some it's harder uh, it depends on uh, the situation in every country I had a survey uh, that showed that many people had uh, with, because of this pandemic situation have used uh, their mobile phones a lot lot more uh, to uh, conduct a studying uh, process, uh, not conduct, to use it in the study process. And to use a tel uh, smartphone for studying is not very, 
it's easier, you can do it from anywhere, but it has a lot of problems. And uh, we will have a problem that uh, will rise uh, in a few months, or maybe even earlier, it depends on the country, uh, with people who graduate, students who will graduate. Uh, and will they have work? Today, it's a lot harder to find work that's not online. And online professions are also uh, very hard to uh, get as specialized, uh, specialist for spe spe specializations uh, like the Bricksologists. Uh, and uh, maybe we should uh, use the Bricks Network University as a platform to have also a bank of uh, vacancies of, of distant work or other uh, proposals uh, on even real work uh, for, or maybe not just work or practice for students. That's a little comment that uh, I just wanted to say. Thank you, thank you, Nina. Thank yeah, you. it's uh, indeed a very interesting proposal. Um, let's switch to the questions. So uh, maybe some questions for our Russian speakers. Uh, the uh, presenters were brilliant. So please, if you have some questions, I see that Cristiano would like to add some fire on our discussion, uh, asking about the claim on uh, some um, many manipulation uh, with the. Um, uh, COVID uh, cases data, but let us um, maybe uh, uh, leave this uh, question uh, uh, to the end of our discussion when all the presenters uh, will um, uh, make their presentations. Um, so, questions, questions, yes, we have questions. Colleagues, I guess from Russia, how do you think uh, non Conventional world problems such as COVID-19 can affect no other more traditional problems such as migration, terrorism, extremism, and other. So maybe we will start um, as we have in, pro in program: uh, Igor, Valeria, Anastasia, and Michael. Yes. Uh, yes. I'll get some for and with the response to this question. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, in my opinion, there is a uh, processes of uh, um, the process when the the real ceasefire we can observe at the, around the world in uh, not not in the every corner of the world, but uh, if we can see, if we see at the uh, west uh, part of Ukraine, uh, eastern part of Ukraine, for instance, the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic, we can see that this crisis has stopped uh, during the pandemic. Uh, if we can, see, if we see at uh, some other regional uh, conflicts, um, they also have stopped. For instance, in South Ossetia, and uh, as about uh, terrorism uh, and extremism. Uh, of course, uh, such um, events um, can be see, could be seen to obviously when the whole world is sitting uh, in their at their houses, but uh, there were not any news uh, on uh, any specific news on these topics, and uh, we can see that uh, COVID COVID nineteen um, decreased this process also. That's my opinion. Thank you. Can I also share my opinion uh, about uh, extremism and terrorism? I, I think that there is another side of the coin because uh, as the economic problems are exacerbated, um, this, uh, I guess, bad uh, measures, these uh, tendencies can increase in the world, unfortunately, especially in the emerging countries, in the countries that uh, previously had these economic problems. Yes, yes, Anastasia. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, I'll uh, maybe uh, provide an answer or, or uh, for a fire question. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I guess uh, when you have such serious events uh, as, as pandemias, 
uh, you do have uh, many problems and discussions and opinions about them. And uh, again, uh, as I was talking in China most of the time, China is also accused of uh, ma manipulation of web statistics. And I guess in this case, we should uh, bear in mind what is politicization of the issue and uh, where the, and the truth, I guess, is somewhere in between as it is as always. And there is also a talk about like uh, if you have authoritarian regime or you have uh, I know a bad government, uh, you do manipulate web statistics. And I guess uh, it is not uh, really so in Russia because uh, yeah, you know there is a northern city. It is called Severodvinsk, and it was closed several days ago uh, on quarantine. And the situation is there is really severe. So I, I mean, if there were uh, severe manipulations with statistics, it would be seen from from what is going on, uh, I mean, in, in real life. You cannot hide dead people uh, for long, I guess. Uh, and for the other question, uh, I, I do think that, so old problems didn't disappear because of pandemia, and this is the consensus about all the experts all over the world. And um, I'll make a small advertisement for you. Uh, we had a seminar with IMF experts in HSC, and it is open online. If you'd like, I can send the links to Valeria. It is very interesting. Uh, it was a very interesting seminar, and I highly recommend to watch it. So. Um, uh, we do see that uh, he was uh, talking um, about the fact that uh, quarantine as a mechanism was invented centuries ago. And basically, from that time on, we haven't invented anything to cope with pandemia. Uh, right, and that was a very interesting thought. So, how else can we cope with pandemia in a highly globalized world? Because the fact that it it worked, this thing worked several centuries ago, doesn't mean that it should work now. Uh, and uh, that was what we see. So, it ruined world economy for uh, in, in during several weeks, and that is what we're experiencing. So, um, if you for instance, look at Yemen, uh, the civil war is going there as it did before. And so hot spots remain hot. And we all know that, uh, for instance, for terrorism or for piracy, uh, the economic and social economic conditions uh, are very influential. And people do make these choices. What is beneficial to work legally or to work illegally uh, in some parts of our world? So uh, I would expect that it would rise. Thank you, thank you. And um, uh, Mikhail, could you please answer this question? And one more, and also other uh, Russian colleagues, I'll uh, kind of ask you to uh, raise a question from Elena um, about the situation in Russia in the next uh, few months. Uh, given the fact that the numbers were high here, and uh, now we have the end of quarantine, what do you think? Um, and uh, Russia is ready to go uh, back to a normal life? If not, then uh, when do you think uh, it uh, could be? So please, uh, uh, Mikhail, could you please answer two questions and then other guys? Yeah, surely. So I'll probably not add too much on the first one, though I'd like to back up Anastasia's uh, idea. It is not really the question if COVID influenced, because it did, quite obviously, but it's about the priorities that are set within a certain political agenda. So when it comes to uh, the Russian campaign in Syria, for example, it was not halted, though the obvious idea might be that you could probably consider it to a certain extent, but they didn't. So it probably is. Uh, you know, it, it has to be studied individually and then we might come up with certain uh, ideas. So um, speaking of uh, Russia ending quarantine, um, so I don't believe that we have it uh, ending on a federal level because uh, it was a presidential decree that uh, the governors do things and try to fix the problem on their own. So the uh, timeline differs from region to region. Um, speaking of Moscow, uh, where I currently reside, I do believe that uh, I guess Russia could, could, could go back to normal at any rate, like that's my personal notion, as long as people follow the basic rules. And even though we had uh, a lot of regulations implemented and uh, Sergei Simonovich Sabanin was often criticized for being a little too harsh, people still fail to follow even his decrees. And that means that it is all about the people in the first place. So when we have Sweden, for example, the Swedish, like the Swedish case is an amazing situation, I believe, in the current pandemic. But it, and it, it is not really that much worse or better than the rest of the world. It's just about people following uh, the social distancing, first of all, social distancing 
and then uh, you know personal how they call like uh, wearing masks and gloves and whatnot so uh, i do believe that uh, yeah russia could go back to normal way way earlier but it was uh, mostly about um, uh, following regulations and precautions thank you thank you Igor, please switch on your mic and uh, how do you think when we go yep. back Thank to normal? Yes, yes. Frankly speaking, I want to uh, support the position of Michael on the, our preparedness for the start for, uh, for the ordinary life, for our usual life, uh, in case we will follow the recommendations of the epidemiological bodies and uh, the uh, rulings and other regulations. But I'm not so very agree with uh, Michael in the case of the uh, Sweden because the, uh, the um, uh, high uh, sanitary uh, doctor of uh, Sweden uh, recognized and uh, told us that uh, there was not a uh, very good way in order to not allow people to isolate their each other. So the um, consequences of this um, politics is not very good because the rate of the deaths, uh, especially among, among the uh, elder, older people, uh, is very high. And uh, if we speak about uh, Sweden, why don't our politologists, uh, why don't our politicians don't tell about Belarus experience? <laughs> that uh, is uh, the same experience, but the rate of the deaths is uh, a little bit less, and the uh, rate of the um, illness people is a little bit less also. So two two exemptions, but two not very different, but very similar experiences. So that is I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe before answering this question, we need to realize what is normal and what is a uh, new normality for our world after COVID-19. Uh, Valeria and Anastasia, your comments on Milena's question. Can I? Oh, yep. Uh, thank you, Milena, for the question because um, I'm thinking about this question personally um, very many times and it's very contradictive. On the one hand, taking into account the amount of afflicted Asian cases and the fact that we have really a huge uh, daily growth at about 8,000 every day. Um, people, um, the quarantine should be uh, prolonged, but as my previous colleague said, uh, people don't, uh, they are just exhausted and they can't say stay at home. That's why the index of self-isolation is have to be desired and plus the economy is, uh, especially small businesses in Russia, um, they are in a downturn. And um, in this um, case, this context, I think uh, we should have left quarantine measures earlier even, but provided that our citizens uh, should follow these rules, uh, these prescriptions of the government. But for now, unfortunately, we don't see this. Anastasia. Yeah, uh, I would continue the thought of Valeria that we have a new normal today for sure. And I've watched uh, a film recently and the, the girl was uh, going out of the cafe with coffee and I thought, oh wow, what is she doing without sanitizer and everything? And uh, <laughs> I, I guess that is, uh, that is the world where we are coming. And um, the thing is that no one knows what is right and what is wrong and what is the most efficient way. And you mentioned Sweden, again, the death toll uh, there is rather high and their, their um, uh, authorities tell that, okay, we should have done it in, in another way and that would be more efficient, that there would be less deaths. But uh, as for now, no one knows where, where, what, what to do and where all uh, inventing new practices. So uh, I guess uh, that we should uh, definitely do for, for, for our personal responsibility is to do what we can not to spread the disease so for social distancing wearing masks and uh, so on and so forth um, and, and uh, I think uh, personal example is very valid in this in this case and uh, another thing is that um, 
uh, the um, appearance of uh, outbreaks is rather high and we saw that in South Korea, we see that in Beijing now and uh, I guess all the authorities, local regional authorities should be very attentive to this. So uh, if uh, these outbreaks occur, then the lockdowns and some other measures should be taken immediately, I guess. Uh, so uh, uh, the normal life can continue, but you should always be very attentive to, to all the changes. Thank you. And maybe some of uh, our commenters would like to uh, add something else. Okay, guys, uh, then uh, uh, let us move to India part. Uh, so I'm very honored to uh, ask uh, Dr. Mohnaya Rahman to present on attracting FDI for BRICS in the post COVID. Please, your seven minutes. Thank you, Valera. At the outset, I thank the National Committee on BRICS Research uh, in general and Ms. Valeria in particular for giving me the opportunity to participate in this webinar. So I'm going to, this is going to be an oral presentation because I want to avoid all the technicalities and focus on what BRICS should attempt to achieve in the next uh, three two to three years in order to revive the BRICS economy. So we need to first understand that there is a framework which is now, which is a framework of international economy within a very risky situation. So right now we are, the, all the, it's all about the world, the whole world as well as the BRICS countries are in a kind of situation where even if the data doesn't tell us that there is an economic crisis, even though if the macroeconomic modeling doesn't suggest that there is a coming of economic crisis, we have the perception playing an important role that the economic crisis is coming into the world as well as to the countries. Now, whenever we have this perception and if the perception is backed by evidences and because it takes time for the evidences to come up, then the most important problem is for the developing countries because developing countries have to cross that particular line where they can sustain their economy with high rates of economic growth. And here the problems come for the BRICS countries because BRICS countries falls under the criteria of developing economies still according to the 2020 classification of OTAN. And BRICS countries, all of the countries aim to be into that particular forum where they will be termed as developed countries. And within BRICS, lots of asymmetries are there with respect to macroeconomic indicators. So in this scenario, what is the most important thing for BRICS country is to create a framework where in the next two to three years, they should be able to attract foreign direct investment. Now, why foreign direct investment has will become much more important in the future because when we talk about capital flows, the unilateral capital flows or any other capital flows, for example, debt is there. This is going to be more expensive in the post pandemic era. And even the terms of taking those loans and unilateral transfer, because the terms are not just economic, they are also political and geopolitical. So the terms of taking loans from IMF, World Bank, and unilateral transfer from developed countries will be in such a scenario where the, the BRICS countries will not be in a situation, or let's talk about the developing countries in general, will not be in a situation to argue. So the more trading power will be with the developed countries and the multilateral organizations. Now, you know, the BRICS has that philosophy that it wants a unique, it wants a multipolar world and it wants to reform the international economy order. Now, if we have to have this kind of philosophy, what we require is that we should be in the BRICS country should be in a position to focus to focus more on such capital flows where ownership is shared. And it is not just a debt and a debt loan relationship. And this ownership sharing comes with foreign direct investment. Not only this ownership sharing is there, the technology transfer, which now we requires for industrialization 4.0, the transfer of digitalization mechanisms which, and systems, which we require for uh, tackling with the, the problems which the other speakers have talked talk about in education, in healthcare. Countries such as, except China and Russia, if you see the other three members of the BRICS, they are lacking behind in artificial intelligence mechanisms and machine learning. Uh, uh, systems which we require to tackle such type of pandemic in the future, the surveillance system, 
the healthcare medical facilities and for all these we now require much more foreign direct investment so my humble suggestion is that now the brics was already brics has done 11 summits now and we have not had any formal ratifications in uh, foreign direct investment we have some understanding that we should have intra brics foreign direct investment but now it is the time that you, taking this post pandemic as an opportunity we should come up with a brics foreign investment promotion board whose particular aim should be to present the case of BRICS as the most attractive destination for foreign direct investment in the next 10 to 20 years. And this can be, this can go a long way because we see that the trade war between China and United States of America and the loose talks of President Trump has given a bad name to the United States of America. And the projects of China, the, the Maritime Silk Route and the Belt and Road Initiative uh, are going to be much more successful in the future and other countries will join. And we, when we are also talking about the BRICS Plus, the important phenomena is that in BRICS Plus, what is the logic that other countries will join BRICS? When BRICS do not have such kind of economic agreements, which will be very important for post-pandemic era. So this particular uh, foreign investment promotion board, if BRICS come up with such a mechanism, which is very difficult because not something has to be sorted out, with respect to some uh, dispute mechanism uh, systems, etc., etc., but we can have an idea initially to come up with that kind of system. That will be very interesting for countries to have foreign direct investment within the BRICS countries, and also attracting foreign direct investment from the rest of the world. And this particular approach will be quite beneficial, and, uh, and this will be efficient when we have foreign direct investments in field. Coming out to the outward foreign direct investment, which is investing in the rest of the world. We know that China is one of the countries in the BRICS and India has also, start, also started joining and other countries also uh, jumping in uh, with the China being one of the outliers in the BRICS having the highest outward fire foreign direct investment in the rest of the world. And this is where the domination in the economics starts. So in international economic uh, economics, what happens is that when outward foreign direct investment increases, means your operations for multinational corporations is ever increasing, this is where domination comes from. And this is where uh, whatever groups you belong to start dominating the international economy. Model. We have the new development bank complex. This can act as uh, this can act in collaboration with the BRICS countries to also focus on outward foreign direct investment. Those countries which are having, which are having uh, advantage in technology uh, within BRICS, they can focus on outward foreign direct investment with respect to technology. Others in other sectors they can focus. On. And this comprehensive agreement can be very vital for the rest of the world, and it will it may make BRICS a future destination for foreign direct investment. If we see the foreign direct investment stock of all the BRICS countries. Before 2000, uh, because we have data for 2018 only, the, the rectified data. If you see the 2018 data at the end, the situation is that there is, they are promising countries, their stock is very good, but the inflows which they are receiving and the outflows which they are providing to the rest of the world, their average growth rate has gone down by around 3% uh, 3% and which is now less than 5%. This is not a very good indicator. We cannot just talk about GDP growth rate as an indicator of big countries. It's just, uh, it, it's a flaw talking about GDP growth rate. We need to talk about other growth rate as well. And before I, my time ends, one of the important things is because of this problem of COVID-19 and the economic issues which we are going to face in the future, this will also lead to some kind of balance of payment prices for all the countries. And this is where we are not talking about. Now, balance of payment prices comes with a crisis to the foreign exchange. India particularly has seen this kind of balance of payment prices in the 1980s, because of which we had to uh, forcibly open our economy in 1991 under new economic policy. So we are again, the British countries are, uh, may again had towards a balance of payment prices because of which their currencies can uh, depreciate. And this we should not allow to do so. So the, the, this this board should also then can avoid such kind of practices which may lead to balance payment prices. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rahman. I'm uh, very pleased to uh, invite uh, Ms. Dwani Jain, who is president of SRPM, and she's also headed the Indian delegation on the World Youth Festival. Ms. Jain? Thank you, Valeria. Good it's evening. Your time. Shall I? Please, Good please. evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to be speaking today with all of you to discuss the role of civil society in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has impacted the life of each one of us in every part of the globe, including the BRICS nations, and has literally taken the world by storm. Due to this, our life actually came to a standstill. And all over the world, strict lockdown measures were implemented to somehow curb the spread of this deadly virus. And initially, when the lockdown started, the most important task in hand was to ensure that the essential commodities are provided to the daily wage earners, the most vulnerable segment of each of our nations, and also the effective screening, testing, and treatment of people. I'm glad that uh, all over the world, voluntary organizations and civil society organizations came to the forefront and played a vital role. Here, I would like to add one very important point about NGOs and civil society, and that is we have an experience of working under ambiguous conditions. And this experience provides us an edge in the present scenario. So as responsible global citizens, it is our foremost duty for all the NGOs, for the civil society across the globe, especially in the British become a pillar of support to their respective governments as well as to the international community. Another important aspect in view of the uncertainty and panic because of the pandemic is proper communication. Now civil society must come forward to disseminate information to the masses. This is particularly important because uh, civil society enjoys a certain kind of trust with the people and the message that is conveyed by the civil society makes for a two-way con communication that uh, prohibits any kind of uh, misinformation from passing or any kind of confusion and that leads to better implementation of the guidelines. Again, the NGOs and non-profit organizations are a kind of bridge between the government and the common people as well as between the nations and therefore we have a great responsibility i would say on our shoulders to raise the valid concerns of the society and become a voice for the most vulnerable irrespective of the nationality irrespective of the ethnicity religion color gender or any other human-based discrimination and uh, when I talk about the impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown at individual level, that is also very severe. We have reports that uh, tell that there's a marked increase in depression levels as people are not allowed to socialize like before. And this situation is even uh, more stressful for the old couples who are staying alone and are not even digital savvy, especially in the developing nations and the underdeveloped nations. Uh, the studies have uh, proved that there's a definite link between happiness and social network. And so I think we need to create some kind of alternate ways to communicate with each other. In fact, uh, when I talk about this, uh, I would like to tell you that only yesterday we lost a young and talented actor in our country, Sushant Singh Rajput, who committed suicide. It is kind of unbelievable and such incidents bring our focus back to the very important issue of mental health, which I think impacts everyone alike, irrespective of the socioeconomic status, which is a general belief that uh, people from a particular background or a particular age would be depressed, but that is not true. In fact, mental health is a very important component and civil society must come forward to help people in stress. After all, uh, I think social distancing must not mean emotionally distancing ourselves from our people. Another disturbing trend is the rapid rise in the cases of domestic violence to the extent that United Nations 
recognized it as a shadow pandemic alongside the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, all of us know that home is the safest haven for any individual. And it is just frightening to imagine the plight of a victim who's suffering in the hands of the so-called family members or the protectors. And uh, the victim has literally no place to go. Their life become a hell and that impacts their physical, mental and emotional health. And as a result, impacts the entire family and the nation too at large. And globally also it will make an impact. So the NGOs uh, and civil society must come forward to help those silent victims. The next challenge uh, I think is to, in view of the current situation, is to adapt ourselves to the changing work style. And uh, like a lot of us have easily adapted and easily moved on to digital platforms and this webinar is one such example. But sadly, a lot of our brothers and sisters, especially in developing nations and I'm sure in a lot of BRICS nations, even today, do not enjoy uninterrupted access to internet and laptops. And the same challenge is in the field of education as well. And uh, a lot of students are attending online classes globally, like some of my previous speakers talked about edX and uh, such platforms, Coursera. But in remote areas, I would like to point out that the ground situation is quite different. And students are really at a risk of dropping out of schools. So I feel the local NGOs must collaborate with the international organizations to somehow fill this gap and help in bridging the digital divide so that the fruits of digitization can reach out to the maximum people. And the most important thing which uh, I would like to focus on is presently all of us know the world is uh, world economy is at an all-time low and the most important task in hand is the economic revival it is sad that a lot of people uh, across the globe are getting out of jobs and i feel it is the combined responsibility of the government civil society and each one of us to provide support to these people ngos have an important role they can impart new skills to the jobless workers and help them in starting a new life. Taking example from my own country, I know a couple of NGOs who are helping self-help groups and providing them necessary support in terms of raw materials, seed funding, marketing and so on. And we can think of such other ways how we can support the people who are losing their jobs during this tough time. And uh, while I talk about boosting the world economy, I feel uh, there's another important, very, very important work that, the, that all of us can do and especially the civil society must, they must create a kind of environment and a campaign to ensure that the economic revival that is planned now is planned in a sustainable manner. And we all have to work together to re-establish a degree of coexistence with nature, to stabilize our economies and our society. We have to learn to live in harmony with each other as well as with the nature. So my appeal to all of you is to resolve, to stand for each other and to be a strength for each other. After all, the world is one family. And this is also the core Indian philosophy as we believe in Vasudev Kutumbakam. I'm sure that uh, together we will be able to cope up with this pandemic soon and build a healthy, peaceful, progressive and egalitarian world. On that note of hope, I would end my talk and I wish all of you the very best for future. Stay safe, stay positive and motivated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really glad to see new faces in our uh, BRICS uh, family. Uh, and uh, let's move on. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, two hours online. So thank you very much for staying uh, online here with us. I see you are all interested in this discussion. Uh, let's move on. We have two commenters from India. And uh, Ms. Anita and Mr. Vikram will share their opinion, please. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Vikram. Yeah. Uh, two observations, lovely presentations given by everyone. Uh, thank you for the info. Uh, as, a, as, as somebody who does monitor a little bit of international relations, 
BRICS cooperation, I would like to point out that within BRICS cooperations within the post-pandemic world, we see basic threats and opportunities within the cooperation. First would be the cooperation dilution, which is hinting because of uh, you know the increasing geopolitics how domestic politics play post-pandemic as the domestic policy within countries is also st stretched to a certain extent. The COVID-19 crisis, in my opinion, has exposed fundamental weaknesses how domestic policies have been going on for a long time. If we take India, for example, the situation of migration from urban to rural amidst the pandemic, how the economy plays in the long run, how domestic policies place Play, play the role at home, increasing nationalism in, and all those domestic factors which are coming into play would set priorities for overall behavior of the government in times to come internationally too. The second point being the current US-China dichotomy, how it's playing and the trickle-down effects which we are seeing, how those roles will play and how BRICS members within themselves uh, tend to keep the cooperation alive and not play a paths with these emerging rhetorics all over the world in terms of especially the US-China uh, uh, game at play would be uh, of paramount importance. And there was a question raised earlier on the role of, let's say, border conflicts and terrorism, how it's affected by the pandemic. In, in view of uh, our, our own country, um, the conflict zones and the border tensions uh, with the two neighboring countries have actually been stable or have grown in the case of China in the last one month. We have been having uh, the two armies are eye, eyeball to eyeball on the borders now. And in this context where we have increasing geopolitical stresses and lack of, uh, I mean, the rhetoric of uh, giving up on Chinese businesses is also rising in India. So in a situation like this, what what we need is higher degree of interdependence between BRICS, not just limiting to economic interdependence, which again has a huge scope of improvement. But we need to have, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Dhwani uh, clearly mentioned, a high level of NGO, civil society, young academic interactions, which will keep on growing in the future, so that you have exchanges and people-to-people -people contact and then create a stronger interdependence on a socio-economic level, not just purely economics, because uh, uh, that's uh, the level of integration we see between, uh, let's say, uh, European Union. It's not just economic interdependence. So the cooperation rhetoric and the ability to cooperate with each other, if you have higher degree of interdependence, is way more if it's just solely military or economic interdependence. Thank you very much for your Thank time. you. Thank you, Vikram. Anissa, please. Uh, thank you, Valeria. Uh, like, first of all, I would, I would say that I'm very glad to be a part of this conference and a part of the Brixologist <laughs> Network. Well, um, let me thank our speakers, uh, Mr. Nayan Rahman and Ms. Dwani Jean for such informative um, reports expressing extremely important topics. Well, there is no doubt that the BRICS approach is uh, very different from the ones previously existing in the Bretton Woods system, applying the mutual interests uh, of the developing world on an equal basis. And the applications of the FDI for the developing world, uh, for the developing countries, uh, might be of a very uh, big importance in a post-COVID time. So the spread and uh, impact of the COVID-19 is uh, unprecedented and uh, causes many other consequences, especially in the economic sector. Uh, well, I'm sorry, probably my internet connection is not very much stable. Uh, well, in any way. So uh, the crisis uh, hits the poorest and the most marginalized communities the hardest. And the situation exposes the widening uh, inequality around the world and uh, threatens to exacerbate the gap between uh, rich and poor. So uh, these and uh, many other aspects like uh, growing public fear and misinformation uh, may, may just fuel the discrimination and the intolerant factors. So the ability to mitigate these impacts uh, relies on the civil society, um, you know, first of all. But unfortunately, uh, well, civil society might 
also face some dwelling resources as a consequence of the widespread economic crisis caused by the COVID. So uh, many scholars even predict that the pandemic may result in a civil society collapse in many countries. So for this reason, uh, BRICS uh, might become a, a special union of well, let's say mutual support among our civil societies in the post-COVID period. And I would say we already uh, possess such platform for this, uh, which is the Civil BRICS Forum. Uh, well, um, the strength of uh, civil society lies in uh, being the small uh, centralized units that have taken responsibility for their uh, entire area, identifying the number of people in the area, the uh, special needs, the some special gaps in the government, really, well, and so on and so forth. So uh, here uh, in the Civil BRICS Forum, uh, we can also create uh, special committees in, uh, on different spheres, uh, which are of uh, common basis of uh, common and mutual interests of the BRICS countries. And by bringing them together and uh, forming a network, special network, we can enable uh, these, uh, let's say, units uh, to call upon each other for um, mutual assistance. And uh, to my mind, um, this idea perfectly works with the um, uh, with the, the Nina Nina Ladiginas proposal concerning the engagement with uh, with the volunteers. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anita. Uh, we are actually working on it, civil uh, BRICS platform, and there are eight working groups. Uh, uh, and I'm looking forward for your commands and initiatives, and also for the initiatives from uh, Ms. Jean on the civil society uh, uh, cooperation on this platform. So please, we're looking forward for your uh, proposals. Uh, we have two personal questions, actually. The first one for Dr. Uh, Rahman uh, about the role of development banks uh, uh, in attracting the future FDI. And uh, another interesting question for Ms. Dwani uh, about the Indian media and about the uh, uh, some censorship in uh, social nets. Uh, so please, uh, Mr. Rahman and then Ms. Uh, Dwani Ji. Thank you for the, this very important question. Uh, now, we can, the first thing is objectively, we do not have very strong evidence that these development banks directly are promoting foreign direct investments or suppose those countries which are getting uh, financing from these development banks are attracting more foreign uh, direct investment we do not have any objective and uh, assessment of those and we do not have very strong evidence for that for that so scientifically we cannot believe in that but uh, from an indirect relationship we can say that these development financing to these banks, they do promote, improve such indicators of the economy, which can then attract more FDI. For example, uh, like take the example of the new development bank, the BRICS Bank, it is providing uh, the financing in uh, green and clean energy. Uh, and therefore, with the help of that, both environmental indicators are improved, as well as the ease of doing business improved in order to attract the development finance. So development finance can act as a, a, as a motivation for the country to improve its other indicators, which may then act uh, in, in, a, in a cycle where then foreign direct investment is added. With respect to the specific uh, boards which you have asked, like uh, the AIIB related to Belt and Road Initiative, uh, particularly this is more China centric and Asia centric. So therefore our other group members like South Africa and Brazil, they are not getting any benefit through these financing. If they are also included, then they will be. So this uh, AIIB uh, under with, which is complementary to Belt and Road Initiative is not directly impacting Brazil and South Africa uh, and even Russia, but other Asian countries are benefiting. So hope that uh, this has clarified your uh, question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Jenny, your quick answer. Yeah, I'll quickly uh, give an answer. Uh, when we talk about India, in India, media is considered to be the fourth pillar of democracy. And we have the right to freedom of speech that is a fundamental right enshrined in the Indian constitution.
so i don't really see that uh, the media in the country is anyhow suppressed or there's there's no control of the media the government does not control media in fact there are instances when we can say there is a, a pro media group and a pro a pro government media and an anti government media and that helps us because um, we get a overall view and that uh, gives the viewers the readers the chance to see what is the right information and what is wrong and uh, when i talk about social media uh, there are pros and cons and uh, particularly in the last few months we have seen a spread of fake messages we are trying to control that in india and uh, the government is working on that and to an extent we have been successful as well uh, along with that social media gives a voice to each one of us and this is a kind of informal media kind of group through which each one of us can uh, run our own campaigns and provide information to the masses so i think uh, in india at least this is not the problem and uh, media as well as each one of us are pretty free to voice our opinions as until they do not uh, harm the peace and security of the nation which is very important we cannot go over the board otherwise everything is available to us all the kind all kind of information is available to the people through media thank you thank you very much so now maybe one of the most interesting part of our discussion where i was switching to china and first we have so, professor you asked me to answer yeah. this question Or yes. Uh, maybe you could ask, uh, answer this question in the chat, writing uh, the answer because okay, we have okay. that, that. time limit. Yeah. Uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Uh, Professor Buffet from University of Jinan with his presentation on public diplomacy interaction between BRICS and West when BRICS lead economic recovery after COVID-19. A very interesting presentation. Professor Buffet, are you here? Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Wait. Uh, yeah. Uh, something with the sound i guess yeah yeah i guess uh, the connection is bad let us wait for a second uh can you hear Yes, maybe you need to switch off your um, camera because the connection is bad for you. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me in the Oh, it's a very bad connection. Um, try again, please. Okay. Unfortunately, no. Um, I propose to switch to another uh, presenter. Maybe uh, Professor Buffet will uh, fix it uh, connection and uh, uh, join us later. Uh, we have Miss Sufurong. Uh, she's a master student, uh, also uh, from the Vladivostok Far Eastern Federal University. Uh, she can tell us about the impact of COVID-19 on youth in China. Uh, Miss Furong, are you here? You need to uh, switch on your mic, please. Maybe we'll switch to another presenter. How about Miss uh, Fantini and Ma Jingao? Are you ready to present? Yes, yes, we are here. Yeah, let's begin from you. <laughs> okay. Can you hear, can you see my screen? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello everyone, because I'm a medical student, so I just give some opinion on the common perversion measures which can be applied in most developing countries. In 2020, the outbreak and the spirit of the new coronavirus in many places around the world de de 
strictly endangered in the lives and health of people around the world, and it has seriously affected in inter international politics and the economy. Due to the globalization, commercial system in different countries has become more and more similar, and the development and the operation of one country highly de depend on others. So we are not fighting ag against the disease alone. For a long time, the worst epidemic situation will continue. Sometimes countries should take measures together so that the epidemic will remain to a low level. But different countries have different culture, tradition, and econo economic and uh, political systems. This means the same measures applied in one country may not be applied in another. But summing up the experience and lessons of various countries during this period, we can get paradigm of necessary measures in fact of the epi epidemic. Then my friend will make the rest of presentation. Okay, and to actually stop transmission, countries must have a comprehensive approach, find, isolate, test, and care for every case and trace every close contact. Through applications on the phone, hospitals can release the route of confirmed case so that people can know whether they are close contacts. Most importantly, remind people to wear a surgical face mask as early as possible, no matter they are health, healthy or not. You can see this picture from my PPT slide. This is an application invented for sharing information. The patient will share his root information on it, and other people can see whether they have been to these same places with the patients to judge whether they are close contacts. And this is a picture to demonstrate the difference between wearing a mask and not wearing a mask. In fact, the transmission rate can be as low as 1.5%. And the second one is the isolation and division uh, of confirmed case, suspected case, close contacts, and common patients is also very important. At the beginning of a pandemic, a lot of people will rush to hospital and there must be a lack of medical resource in this situation, doctors should separate them into these different groups. Otherwise, cross-infection may happen. This measure don't demand highly high technology. Proper management of hospital is enough. And, and the third one is lockdown. So-called lockdown measures have been successful in many countries to slow down the transmission but due to the different political systems of different countries, this measure cannot be implemented effectively in every region, but we still need to close public places with dense flow of people, as many as possible. This is a square in Wuhan. Before the pandemic, there were a lot of people in this square to go shopping or to do some sports. But after the lockdown the policy, uh, no, no people come here. And in fact, this is, this is a very effective way and very easy way to reduce the transmission. And it's also a very traditional way. And this measure don't need any technology. Every country, every developing country can do this. And the fourth is avoid unnecessary shopping and gathering. When we are doing necessary shopping, keep at least one meter distance from others and avoid touching your eyes, mouth, and nose by your hands. Once go back home, wash your hands after disinfecting your purchased product. And the fifth, large scale activities 
should be held online to slow down and decrease the contact and gathering of people. The One World Together at Home concert is a very good example. And in China, there are more and more online meetings and online movie theaters during the epidemic. And until now, the first wave of epidemic is continuing. In the future, there may be the second and the third wave. Although they won't be as severe as the first one, we should still pay attention to the early intervention of the transmission. Maybe we pay one dollar in the early age, early stage. Say we will save hundred dollars and lives in the future. And above are some measures that every country can take to prevent the spread of epidemic for developed countries. The level of medical care is relatively very high. Sometimes, although tough measures were taken late, they can still control the epidemic. For developing countries, every city should take these measures as soon as possible. And in addition, all countries need to cooperate with each other when fighting against the epidemic. Medical supplies, donation, and medical experts' assistance are very essential cooperation in the early stage of an epidemic. As a group, BRICS countries should establish a cooperation mechanism. However, in addition to language problems, the different standards of different countries for medical products are also a major problem. I have been doing some translation and volunteer work of face masks donated by Chinese organizations to foreign countries during this epidemic. Many countries have different standards for these medical products. For example, for a face mask, the Chinese standard is KN95. The American standard is N95. South Korean standard is KF94. And most European countries follow the FFP2 standard. Most international standards have been accepted in all countries, and a few of them are not universally accepted, which makes the donation process of medical supplies not very smooth. This epidemic also made us realize that we need to accept standards of different countries in advance and co correspond them with our domestic standards so that unnecessary troubles can be reduced during an emergency, especially within BRICS countries or beyond BRICS countries. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you very much. So the next presenter is uh, Ms. Sue Furong. I guess uh, she's okay with her PPT. I'm here, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see your presentation. Please, your seven minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Sue Furong from China and also I'm from Paris Federal. East Federal University. Uh, it's an honor to join today's webinar. Uh, I prepared a briefly uh, presentation. Uh, my to topic is the impact of COVID-19 on young in China. This topic, con uh, this co uh, topic contains two aspects. One is positive influence and the other is negative influence. Uh, in the outbreak of China in early 2020, the uh, sudden uh, COVID-19 is the largest public health incident that has spread the fastest and has the widest scope of uh, infection and uh, has the most difficult prevention and control si uh, signs uh, the founding of New China. Chinese young people have experienced more than just an unprecedented the, the, the epidemic exam is also a life marker uh, for their psycho psychological growth and uh, mature thinking. During uh, the epidem epidemic, 
uh, countless young Chinese generations joined the uh, front line to fight epidemic. The girl in the picture is from, to, uh, is from the Department of Medicine of Tsinghua University. After the outbreak, she worked 104 days on the job. She did not, she did not uh, enjoy any vacations. She produced uh, antibodies in the laboratory uh, every day, uh, uh, monitored uh, antibodies and uh, conducted uh, animal exper uh, experiments. Uh, the girl said that uh, as a young man, uh, when facing difficulties in the country, uh, the young man must be brave and uh, courageous. Of course, uh, this girl is just a microcosm of uh, many young Chinese. According to statistics, uh, during this fighting against COVID-19, 40% uh, of young nurses under the age of 30 who came to Hubei, China to fight against the epidemic. A survey uh, conducted by the University of International Business and Economic found that uh, values of Chinese young people were affected during the epidemic. In terms of social outlook, many young people have become more responsible. In terms of national outlook, it has a greater sense of national identity. Uh, in terms of international uh, perspectives, young people have become more open and uh, inclusive and uh, focusing on international cooperation. The picture shown, uh, shows the level of participation of young Chinese. Moreover, during the epidemic, Chinese society had a higher evaluation of the younger generation in China. On the, on the other hand, uh, young people cannot avoid negative effects uh, from the epidemic, for example, young employment. This, uh, this chart of the number of colleagues uh, graduates in China. In 2019, Chinese college graduates reached uh, 8.36 million. Uh, it reached uh, 8.74 million in 2020. The speed of economic development has, has the most direct the significant impact on employment. The economic growth rate in the first quarter of 2020 is expected to be significantly lower than 6%, uh, with, e with even greater declines, and the labor market demand will decrease. Uh, this shows that uh, young people in China will be affected in terms of employ employment, and even some people may not be able to find work. Uh, so, um, my conclusion, uh, this COVID-19 uh, period has had some uh, positive effects on Chinese young people. They are more response and more tolerant. Uh, on the other hand, some young people have to face uh, employment pressure and even unemployment risk. Uh, that's all. Thank you for everyone. Thank you for your here. Yeah, I got it. Uh, <laughs> I kindly ask Professor Wufei uh, to uh, uh, try one more time to connect us. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, but oh. yeah. Uh, okay. uh, oh, sorry, the connection is very bad, unfortunately. Uh, you now have a proposal for you. Uh, as I uh, see your presentation is maybe one of the most interesting today, maybe you will uh, send us your uh, PPT and um, a video of your uh, 
presentation when uh, you give us a small lecture on uh, this topic and we'll also share it with all the uh, participants and uh, uh, uh also with uh, all our uh, auditory that uh, is listening to us today and now i propose to uh, look for some questions for china uh if there are some questions um okay uh there is one question for uh chinese presenters about um um measures about measures that were adopted uh, by Chinese government to stimulate uh, economy uh, but does Beijing try to prevent unemployment increase I think uh, Sue or Mark can uh, uh, try to answer this question uh, yes um, Beijing has taken some measures in fact um, have you heard the how to translate it from Chinese into English. It is It is a kind of economy which depends on a lot of people go to the streets to sell their products. Uh, before, before the pandemic, uh, Chinese streets, uh, people cannot uh, freely go to the streets to sell products because it will it, uh, affect the management of city or the transportation. But during this uh, during this uh, pandemic, a lot of people lost their job, but the government permit them to go to the streets to sell some products like shoes made by the, themselves or like clothes or like some small products. Uh, I think it is a measure to uh, prevent the unemployment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my proposal to switch to uh, South Africa. Uh, our uh, loved colleagues from South African BRICS Youth Association are going to present on uh, uh, two important uh, topics, uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on youth in South Africa and the educational system in South Africa and uh, the um, uh, COVID-19 situation. I uh, invite Mr. Raymond Matlala to present. Are you here? Um, hello, colleagues. How are you? Yeah, we're fine. We can't see you. Sorry, my video is a bit... Uh, it doesn't want to. Let me quickly try to check if I'm able to... Yeah, it's giving me problems. I don't know why, but I'll get it fixed. No problem. I know how you look. <laughs> Please, uh, <laughs> um, you can present. <laughs> Thanks, Valeria, and thanks uh, to all the speakers and everyone. Colleagues, um, without wasting any further time, look, I'm going to dip into uh, the impact of COVID-19 uh, on, on youth, in particular in South Africa. And we can then look at um, some synergies and some practical implementations that we can carry forward as young people um, in the BRICS relations and the BRICS plus. Uh, basically, they are, you know, sorry, I don't have a presentation as well. Um, and if I'm, I'm too fast, you know, people can just um, interrupt me and um, tell me that uh, I'm a bit too fast. But, you know, there are a few things that I'm going to speak about here. It's the, the social, economic and political impact. Uh, and I will start with um, the social. Um, what, what has happened here is that, um, as you might, you know, you, you might know, is that young people are, you know, more reliant on uh, mobile devices and, you know, um, data in order to, to stay connected uh, during this period. Um, what, we, we, what we are facing here is that the majority of 
young South Africans live in um, rural areas where um, the, the connectivity is, is a bit um, problematic. So as a result, uh, many of our young people are unable to join um, you know, conferences and webinars like this online due to um, connectivity and the, 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 um, the, the, the effect of data in terms of pricing. You know, South Africa is one of the countries that has got um, highest level of, highest level of um, uh, data pricing in the, in the world. And there's a commission looking into that. Uh, let's not get into that now. Um, you know, the, then the second one, which is uh, quite um, an impact in people's li livelihoods, um, is the economy. Um, what we have seen here is that we have seen uh, most companies here in South Africa um, retrenching uh, many workers, which includes young people. In fact, um, South Africa on its own has got just over 50% of unemployment rate, which um, about 80% um, of that is youth unemployment. Um, and as a result, this pandemic has caused uh, the country quite a strain in, in that it cannot even create new jobs uh, that you know, they were supposed to be, uh, to, to be creating, but rather, um, you know, companies are closing down, you know, Many companies have um, filed for a voluntary uh, business rescue. Um, and, you know, we, we see, you know, more of more of more companies closing down and retrenching, um, laying off um, young people. We also seeing um, the new normal, which is uh, the adaptation, uh, adaption of, of technology in in conducting business um, work and some some social events like your birthday parties as well as your um, baby showers, you know, um, and 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 um, that has been one one significant uh, you know positive outcome that has came out of of the pandemic, and of course um, we we also we also see um you know schools um and and my colleague will touch on on that uh, but you know there is a um there is a two layers of of ministries of uh, schooling in in south africa and the one is the basic education the other one is the higher education which looks into uh tvet colleges as well as universities and private um higher uh, institutions like your private colleges and so on and what, what has been happening in that area is that um, the department uh, has established a task team which is, is to look into um, online teaching and learning. And many universities are adapting to that. However, the challenge that, that we have seen in that it, it is still uh, the lack of resources in terms of um, laptops for students in particular that are sitting in that are disadvantaged and are on uh, government um, funded programs like uh, the National uh, Financial Aid Scheme. We've also seen also uh, the lack of uh, data where, um, you know, providers, service providers of um, mobile technologies have came forward to, um, you know, to, to say we, we will zero rate some of the uh, online programs and so on, but even that, we, you know, young people still need um, data to access these things. But, you know, one thing that has come out quite strongly, and I left it intentionally in the beginning, is gender-based violence here in South Africa. Um, we've seen an increase of gender-based violence, and um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still not sure, as, as I'm sitting here, without um, adequate research on to what might be the cause uh, during this pandemic for gender-based violence to, to be on the rise. But, you know, as I'm sitting here um, with, a, with, with a little knowledge of analysis is that um, because it's, it's because everyone is sitting at home, people are locked at home with their partners, with their families, with their abusive boyfriends, girlfriends, fathers, mothers, and so on. 
And we've seen a rise, a, a huge rise of that. In the last week, we've seen, um, in, in particular, women being murdered by their partners and so on. Um, and and this, this is a, an alarming concern for us as young people, in particular men who are, you know, uh, mostly the, the uh, culprits of, of this uh, incident happening in our country. Um, and, and, you know, lastly, colleagues, in terms of uh, the, 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 you know, the impact of, on, into politics, uh, in, in the, political, the imp political impact of COVID-19 is that um, we've seen, I mean, South Africa is, is one of the countries in Africa with high rate um, uh, with high cases, high uh, positive cases reported. And why is that? Is because um, politically we were able to mobilize the resources in, in, in terms of testing. So we, 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 we are doing, I mean, compared to many of our African countries here, we are uh, doing about 20 to 30,000 tests a, a day. Where else you, in, in your average uh, testing in Africa, it's just under 500, uh, 500 um, um, testing per day. We, we're doing um, exceptionally well on that. And that is why, you know, we've seen the rise um, in, in, the, in the country um, being one of the, the top in Africa in terms of uh, positive cases, of course. Um, our recovery also sits at about um, 55, 56% of those, and, and our, our debt toll sits at about uh, 10 to 12% of that, uh, of that rate. Um, so we, generally, we're doing good as a country in terms of, um, um, you know, the, the, the keeping, tracing and contact and, and testing and so on and so on. But um, that is, you know, what, it, what has uh, this done, it has impacted negatively um, in, in people's livelihood. Um, although our government has got um, some relief funds, um, they've announced about 500 billion rands um, in, to inject into the system uh, in terms of uh, social reliefs and business reliefs and so on. But also, no, not everyone qualifies um, for, for those reliefs and, not, and they also not enough. So as a result, um, we have seen, um, we will be experiencing some livelihood uh, crisis in the next few months. Um, colleagues, I don't want to waste any further time. Um, that is where I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Rama, and, uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Ms. Pavel Lamini to continue. Hi, um, good day, colleagues. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, just for internet connectivity issues, I'm also going to switch off my video so that I can be able to have um, a secure network. Um, so please hold. Thanks, uh, Raymond. Um, thank you so much. And to all our other colleagues, um, just to add on also to uh, what Raymond has reiterated, as you can imagine, the undesirable impact and effects the pandemic has caused to a third world, third world country like South Africa, that has so many underlying social and economic imbalances post-apartheid. It has been over 15 years, over 25 years, sorry, after apartheid, and nearly 90% of all households still without access to the internet at home. More than 80% of public schools are under-resourced. The COVID-19 pandemic has further exposed and magnified the inequalities in South Africa's education system. Now, I'll be giving a brief overview of some of the challenges the education system in South Africa is facing amid the COVID-19 pandemic. The country closed all schools in March 2020 as part of lockdown measures that were taken by government to prevent the spread of the virus. And these measures unearthed a wide range of imbalances right across the educational landscape. Well, the first challenge that I will talk about, which Raymond has already mentioned, but I will just further elaborate on, is online education. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, online education is becoming more and more popular around the world. Although some scholars around the world can argue that online education is more affordable, but the opposite can be said when looking at a country like South Africa. 
Firstly, a lot of students in townships and rural areas do not have access to smartphones and laptops, as we've, we've said, uh, as Raymond has discussed. Secondly, most students do not have access to the internet. Thirdly, data prices remain unaffordable to the majority of people in South Africa. According to a report by cable.co.uk, which is a UK price comparison website, South Africa ranks 148 out of 228 countries on the price of mobile bandwidth. The average price of one gig in South Africa is 88 rents, or you can convert it to $4. In mentioning these three challenges associated with online education, we can already see a digital divide, which is a gap that exists between individuals who have access to modern information and communication technology and those who lack access. The second challenge is infrastructure. Just to also add on to the technological infrastructure, which is often combined with few people in these facilities having advanced technological skills, and secondly, water and sanitation at school is still a big challenge. Lack of sanitation also contributes to malnutrition, lost educational opportunities, and a lack of dignity. A study conducted by Asivik Elani, a basic service delivery monitoring tool, has shown the spotlight on the daunting state of access to water and sanitation in informal settlements across South Africa. Finding that one out of every five informal settlement residents does not have consistent access to water and sanitation. The third challenge is on nutrition. As we all know, a healthy body means a stronger immune system, which is vital to defeating the virus. Those living in informal settlements and lower income communities are also dealing with food shortages. Many in these areas also rely on schools to provide their children with the necessary three meals a day. But what happens now that schools are closed and communities are on a lockdown? The fourth challenge is curriculum coverage. There's a lot of backlog in curriculum and teachers are expected to develop catch-up programs for students to cover up for lost time. The question is, will they be able to make up for the lost time? The problem with policy is not generating it, it is the implementation and the management of things. These challenges represent the core problems that education in South Africa is facing during the pandemic. The following solutions can be implemented and hopefully assist with the way forward. The first solution is to offer formal training in applied technology skills together with the provision of computers for schools across the board. Universal access to information needs to be the goal with this is something that can be achieved by the government with public-private partnerships and collaboration with numerous civil society organizations and multilateral organizations like BRICS. Secondly, curriculum reform is urgently needed in South Africa. Schools must teach more than reading and writing. They must empower people to become independent and critical thinkers. We should have a revolutionized education system through careful planning, financial commitment, and by making education non-negotiable. All these reforms will cost money and may appear impossible. It is therefore imperative that government and civil society employ new and creative methods and for government to start doing more with existing resources. Thirdly, we cannot speak about development within the education sector if we do not address the underdevelopment of townships and rural areas. This will, involve, this will involve establishing adequate school infrastructure and also create jobs. Lastly, South Africa can look at other BRICS countries to solve some of the challenges, incorporate solutions and in, improve from there. South Africa's former president Nelson Mandela once said, Education is the great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that a son of a mine worker can become the head of the mine, and that the child of a farm worker can become the president of the great nation. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have uh, a commenter today uh, from South Africa, Mr. Thando Matanawa. I hope I am pronouncing it right. Please switch on your mic and please your command. 
Yes, you are very close, Valeria. I'll give you that. Very close. Yes. Thanks. Yes, yes. Hi, guys. My name is uh, Tando Matendwa. Um, just from my side, yes, very close. Yeah. Um, I just thought I'd also briefly add on to what Ms. Piwe and uh, Raymond have mentioned in terms of more specifically looking at uh, education. So I recently graduated uh, from the University of Witwatersrand with my master's. And um, some of my uh, mates are still doing research and so forth. And they've just explained some of the challenges they faced. And um, obviously over and above that, I'll just tap into some of the broader challenges which have become prevalent in the news more especially. So um, obviously the one of the, the more prominent challenges is you have a large population who has a, a limited access to modern technology. So you, you view it as a, a, a simple need having a, a laptop or a computer. But uh, from my side, having studied at the uh, University of Cape Town, I had um, mates with me who had never seen a laptop prior to the university environment. You know, so we, we overlook that aspect of uh, saying, okay, well, we'll just sort the solution out by giving everybody um, a laptop or access to a computer. But the reality is a lot of people do not even know how to use these modern technologies uh, over and above uh, smartphones and stuff, just uh, accessing software, how to use Excel, how to use Microsoft Office. So they're not too familiar with, with the, the modern tech that's actually available out there. That being said, it's, it's almost like uh, we've been thrusted into, into the fourth industrial revolution, you know. So the world is going forward into that direction of uh, modern tech, uh, AI, uh, big data. But I feel like South Africa almost missed the third industrial revolution because people really don't know what, what tech can do and uh, how to effectively use it. We're still very much dependent on labor, very much dependent on uh, old school techniques, as mentioned by SPWare, regarding just simple reading and writing. So I think uh, we need to ensure we, we get youngsters, you know, the youth over and above uh, out of school, but as early as school, being able to, to play with um, technology, to fiddle with tablets, to, to actually have an idea of how, how these uh, modern techs work. Uh, I think uh, I'll briefly touch on it, uh, but uh, Spiwe and Raymond have already mentioned the, the price of data. Um, I think even just for myself, just to join this uh, youth webinar, it must have cost me about $10, $20 to buy data to make sure that I've got a solid connection. And even then I'm coming in and out. So it's just those things that uh, might impact uh, uh, the youth, particularly for education. Um, over and above that, uh, we also see a trend where a lot of universities have, have uh, very centralized controls. What do I mean by that? I mean, um, core infrastructure at a university is, is based on campus. Um, very, very few um, decentralized learning centers. So if you go to a university in Johannesburg and uh, there's no real satellite branch where you can access um, uh, computers or perhaps uh, access uh, just basic infrastructure that you can use when you're on holiday or when you're away. So those who are in rural areas most of the time do not have access to, to um, modern tech to actually uh, do their assignments, do their research and so forth. So I think the universities really need to consider how do they decentralize the, the learning process? You know, it's very much at the stage focused on, uh, I would say, uh, getting the students on campus and then from there taking control. But at this stage, you know, mid, mid uh, semester, students had to go home but uh, the curriculum continued. It was um, from about uh, mid-April, they said, okay, well, we're starting with varsity, and that kind of hindered. Over and above that, uh, you also have that uh, gross inequality between private and public education. Um, even within public education, you have the haves and the, the have-nots, you know. There's, you have your common 
um, what we term Model C schools, which are a little bit more in affluent areas. They're well established. Uh, they've got the, the infrastructure, but even within the public sector, there's those that do not have. So there's those aspects that, that really hinder us. Um, I, I agree with Raymond. There has been um, an effort to have zero rated university websites, but uh, I'll use a simple example. If um, I know that uh, Spiwet Lamini has a, 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 an article, chances are it's not gonna be on a zero rated website. If she's not on the university database and I want that article, I'm gonna have to pay for that and actually access it. So those are some of the things that um, I've picked up. Over and above that, uh, there's also been a lack of uh, preparedness. You know, the, the schools within uh, Gauteng and Western Province, two provinces out of nine were the most prepared in terms of protective equipment, hand sanitizer, screening the kids. But that is the only provinces out of nine potential provinces to actually uh, prepare for the schooling calendar. So that's another challenge. So, so what do we do? What are some of the solutions we can address? Uh, obviously, ensuring that um, exposure to modern technology is done at an earlier age. I'm, I'm not saying give everybody a laptop, but at least give them a, a bit of a feel prior to thrusting them into this fourth industrial revolution. You know, there's not much known in terms of tech. There's not much known about software to explain to someone what a hard drive is what the graphics card is, they're just not too inclined. So those are some of the things. You can get people exposed at a younger age. Um, even uh, entrepreneurship. As the youth, um, we, we do tend to complain about data costs and so forth, but uh, we do need a drive to, to get more entrepreneurs into the tech space, even if it's a case of uh, um, building more infrastructure or using or getting a more a wide range of uh, um, technological products beyond uh, your, your, your big players, the likes of Microsoft, uh, the likes of uh, Apple and so forth. So we, we can actually drive that chain. And uh, lastly, I think um, a big one, big one, we really got to push for reduced data costs, especially with uh, the, the, the drive to move education online. I think we really need to see a movement coming from government that is uh, progressive, deliberate and aggressive towards the driving, to drive down the prices of data in South Africa. So I'll leave it there. I know people are slowly burning out. Valeria has even got a night lamp on there. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but uh, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to comment. And if you do have any suggestions, I'll also pop my email there the likes of Spiwe and Raymond, I'll also get in touch with, uh, with them. So please guys, please, we, we are looking for solutions in South Africa. We, we're not gonna just sit idle and wait for government. So please, let's see what we can do here. Thank you, thank you very much for a profound command. Uh, so this is most the end. We have uh, um, an interesting guest today because we're talking uh, about BRICS Plus and we need to um, build some, uh, um, connect uh, our uh, con uh, cooperation uh, and bridges with the other non brics state uh, countries. And today we have uh, uh, Mr. Kenneth Gimeno. Uh, he's from um, Department of Foreign Affairs, uh, Republic of the Philippines. This is very interesting to uh, uh, have you here. So uh, please, your comment on the COVID-19 situation in your country and on some uh, initiatives uh, that we can share, please. Uh, hello, uh, good evening from Manila. So I, since we have been talking for uh, more than three hours, I think uh, I'll make it short. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank the National Committee on BRICS Research, the BRICS uh, Russia Expert Council, and BRICS International School for giving me airtime in this webinar. Listening to the prior speakers, I would say that uh, the COVID-19 situation in the Philippines is more or less similar. The pandemic forces us to think and do things in an unprecedented manner. In education, for example, online learning platforms become a boon and a bane. It is a boon for tech sub students who find it more convenient than physically attending school. 
It is a bane for those who cannot even afford to go to a computer shop. Akin to diplomacy, the government is working on a compromise to deliver goods and services such as food and education amid the crisis. One perspective being studied is how to integrate public health into the economy. BRICS Plus is an innovative approach to economic integration that is open to the participation of developing and developed economies. As the West bears the brunt of the novel coronavirus, the decentralized framework of BRICS Plus makes more sense to jumpstart the world economy. This is in contrast with the core periphery model of globalization that is characterized by extreme inequality and poverty. We hope that this kind of discussion among the youth will carry forward the aspirations of emerging economies such as the Philippines, leading to more equitable rules and more responsible global governance. Thank you. Thank you very much for your short command. Uh, guys, we have uh, one interesting question. Please allow me to ask our South African colleagues. Um, the question is, how can you estimate the situation with the help uh, for your state from the other countries during the pandemics? And which countries became the key partners in the humanitarian sphere in this period? So please, somebody from uh, South Africa side, uh, could you please answer this question? Of course. Um, thanks, Valeria. Look, um there's been a, a few states that uh, i've seen personally publicly announced you know we've got the us we've got germany we've got india we've got russia um but mainly i've seen china as the biggest contributor to to this one um on a monthly with a monthly uh, contribution to uh, testing equipments and ventilators and ppes you know protective gas Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. So yes, it's more than three hours we are online. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you could join us today. I'm kindly ask you to switch on your cams uh, to make a family photo for today's uh, uh, discussion. This was very interesting and uh, thank you for uh, such an experience and I'm glad to meet all of you here. Uh, I will send all the presentations to you and share the video record. Uh, hope to see you soon offline. Please uh, uh, stay safe, take care and uh, stay in connection with the BRICS uh, uh, network of young leaders. And as uh, uh, Beatrice proposed to uh, say BRICS, <laughs> to have smiling on your faces. Yes, you can switch on your mics uh, and um, give a, uh, a small amount of applause to ourselves for su such a great discussion for today. Thank you very much uh, one more time. Uh, if somebody else would like to uh, switch on his uh, uh, cam, or her cam, yeah. Yeah, I can see you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We are uh, heroes for today. Thank you very much. One more time. And I hope to see you soon in Bricks. Russia. Yes, Bricks. <laughs> Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end. Uh, take care, please. Keep safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, thank guys. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice to talk to you. Thank you, guys. Thank bye, you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Nice Goodbye. Time. Please don't forget to send the presentations. Yes, of course, of course.